minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. All right, everybody, welcome to episode four of Kush's Corner here on the Trap Talk Reptile Network, the coolest reptile network in the world. Tonight we have on Brandon Wheeler from Morelia House. As you can see from the thumbnail for anyone who is watching, uh, one of the main topics of the night will be scrub python, something that both Brandon and I hold very near and dear. But we have plenty else to talk about other than scrub pythons. But before we get to that, U.S. Arc. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, which I can't imagine as many of you, U.S. Arc is the organization that is fighting for our rights to keep reptiles, to run our reptile businesses, to, to continue this way of life. If you are not already a member of U.S. Arc, go to their website, sign up for a membership. As an industry, we have strength in numbers, so the more members there are of U.S. Arc, the better. And tonight we are also brought to you by Sundown Reptiles. So Brian Susan. Uh, a good friend of mine, somebody who I really respect in this industry. If you're interested in rare geckos, tree monitors, abronia, or any of the other things that Brian works with, definitely check him out on all forms of social media. Like I said, somebody who I really look up to and uh, someone who I think is, kind of is showing a great example for what it means to be a professional breeder in today's day and age. We are also brought to you by Mark Bailey Reptiles. Uh, Mark Bailey is, is somebody who I admire very, very dearly in this industry, a mentor of mine. Uh, he was producing the best ball pythons in the world before I was alive, a uh, real OG in this industry, both with, with ball pythons, rodents as well. So if you're looking for high quality ball pythons from one of the OGs to do it, definitely check out Mark Bailey of Mark Bailey Reptiles. We're also brought to you by Blake's Exotic Feeders. Uh, if you are looking to feed quail to your reptiles, looking to either vary the diet or to provide birds to a, a bird specific species, check out Blake's Exotic Feeders. All, they hand raise all of their quail so that you know they're all here produced here in the United States. So they're high quality. So definitely give them uh, check them out. All right. So here we are. Here we are for episode four. And uh, man, the the chat's already bumping. Let's see who's already here. 1776 exotics what's up lucid arboreal thanks for thanks for stopping by we got tj chambers in the house what's going on alex oliver thanks for being here dude what's up joe meteoric serpents hey brooke thank you for being here we got we got mr mr kenneth cush in the house i i wonder who i wonder who that is calvin's here assuming for the scrub talk What's up, Dustin? I'm glad you're able to make it. But uh, hey, before we could keep going, there's a lot of people here, and I'm I'm very thankful for it. But uh, let's bring in Brandon. What's Dude, up? What's going on, man? Just trapping, man. Trapping <laughs> on a Wednesday. Excited to be trapping. here. Thank you. I had the itch for a podcast, man. I was ready. I, I saw you were starting up Kush's Corner, and I'm like, that's it. That's it. Let's go. I think I found some stupid reason to hit you up, and then you invited me. It was perfect. It was totally on purpose. I was fishing. Yeah, not going to lie. Almost, uh, and you, this, is, this is the guy who you had to, had to follow. He's, he's, he's here to, to judge you. Oh, I, I like being judged. That's okay. <laughs> I'm here for all the mistakes. <laughs> But yeah, man, I'm, I'm really, I'm glad we're able to do this. Uh, you know, I, I think, well, for me, one of the main topics, obviously, that that I'm, I want to cover here on on this channel is is the scrub pythons. And, you know, you were, you were scrubbing it up before me, you know. So mm -hmm. you were someone who, when I was first getting into it, you know, you bred the Southerns. What year was that we bred the Southerns? They are five or six years old now. So like 2018, 2019, something like that. I'd have to go back and look, but I yeah. want to say probably, probably 2018. I'd have to go back and look okay. 2018, 2019. But yeah, man, I, I've always loved scrub pythons. I didn't know 
So the first time I got a scrub python, I was, uh, let's see, I'm 38 and I would have been 21. So a while ago. And I bought a Malukan python at a show and I didn't know what it was. I knew what scrub pythons were, but I didn't know what Malukan pythons were. Uh -huh. And I, I saw it in a deli cup and it was 250 bucks at the South Carolina show where they've got all the venomous and stuff that it gets, it gets down out there. And uh, yeah, I just saw it on a table. I'm like, holy shit, it's a yellow scrub python. And I bought it. And then, you know, the, that was, that was my first one. So yeah, 250 bucks. Yeah, that's uh, that's nothing you're gonna see these days, unfortunately. the The days of the two hundred fifty dollar Malukan are are well in the past. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I remember looking at Bolins for like eighteen hundred, and me being like, "God, who would pay that for?" A fund? You know, like it just man, hindsight twenty twenty, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it, it definitely speaks to the the evolution of of what we're doing, especially with you know with the scrub pythons, even as of you know, even 10 years ago, eight years ago, I feel like it was still a species that was was generally speaking pretty much overlooked by by most people. Everyone, yeah, yeah. There, I mean, it was a very niche thing to even know what it was, let alone have one, let alone be raising some up and trying to breed them. I I love that my pair. I mean, it, they're they're cool they are the sweetest snakes that i own are probably my malukins you can do anything mm. with them they're completely fine they're, they're so easy going i've got the captive bread pair from that marcel produced um siblings to patrick siblings to your siblings to mj says i love it how I, oh, we all were just like yes <laughs> do they come around that often yeah yeah so you know the, one of us has got to get those those they're just they're pretty dude that line that he has like the exantics gorgeous i love that minor head exantic you have one or two exantics i have one female from that collection okay yeah and uh you know the fact that they're the rest of them are you know hats that's that that's that's pretty cool too yeah, so anyway it interests me because you know, with all the azanthics that that are wild collected, uh, to me that clutch begs the question: Are all Malukans had azanthic? Well, I haven't seen. I was really impressed with what Marcel was able to do with that because, like, I, I had never seen anyone selling azanthic Malukans before those mm. were produced, not publicly. You sure. know, I mean, when's the last time you saw one in? The, is there ever been on the market? And, you know, like, yeah, a, a king snake. I never saw any in all the years that I would scour kingsnake.com. Yeah. yeah. So, there, I mean, definitely not many. You know, I, I've only really been involved in the scrub market like since Malukins kind of started to disappear because I, I got my first one in 2017. Um, okay. And, you know, that that was back when they were in like the seven hundred to thousand dollar range. But uh, J uh, Switowski had gotten a couple of Xanthics. I know Dan Maleri got a couple of Xanthics. So like they were they were floating around. But, you know, if you if you see pictures from from some of these people over in Indo, I mean, I see this one dude, he posted like 20 classes in a day and like half of them were Xanthic. And you could tell these are all pretty fresh, wild caught. You know, they were still like had that kind of shiny jungle skin on them, you know that is kind of wild like you look at the the nada you know the tannin bars yeah. and exantic completely took over that breed yeah. you know that species yeah. it's you know the hardest thing to find is a gold patterned one right you know so like the, the normal is the morph kind of when it comes yeah. to those yeah i mean but like you think about it, you know, with some human populations, that's the same with like blue eyes, you know, go to Northern Europe and, you know, Northwest Europe, everyone has blue eyes, but that's a recessive gene, you know, that it just happened to take over the population over the, you know, thousands of thousands of years. What kind of group of tannin bars are you stashing over there? You got a few, don't you? I do. Yeah, I, I have 3.3 tannin bars and I, I'm very lucky that I have all four uh, of the color phases. You have all four? I have all four. 
<laughs> so yeah, my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still learning the technology side of this, but I'll try to throw up a picture of, uh, of my, my male. He's, he's just absolutely stunning. He's the patterned uh, Xanthic. So the yellow, he's, uh, he's pretty nuts, but yeah, I mean, dude, I, I think that, that tannin bars, I think they can kind of be like the super dwarf scrub of the future. You know, when people hit me up, a lot of the time they're they're asking about tannin bars. So I think that, you know, that seven foot size range really, uh, you know, really seems to be appealing to people. Now, in my experience, those have been kind of the most snappy just as a whole, the ones that I've worked with versus, yeah. you know, everything else. Is that true in your collection? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're all wild costs. So I, I feel like that's going to skew the, the kind of the data on that. Um, because, you know, like I, I've, I have bigger barn eggs and stuff like that, that were big wild caughts and were never really handled. And, you know, like I, I'll work with them, but I'll never hold them. Like I will my captive breads. Um, the my my male who's the the xanthic patterned he's a puppy dog I, I can i can hold him you know whenever i i, I feel like it um some of the other ones they're just flightier that i've found than the rest of the scrubs they're kind of like their temperament is a little bit more like a team or python if that makes sense quicker oh, so they shit on you all the time they they they, they will but um <laughs> <laughs> but more in the way of have you worked with timors not personally in my collection. I've played with plenty, but I've never owned yeah. them before, unfortunately. So from, from your experience with them, and I've, I've worked with Timors too, you know, scrubs are, are like barnecks and Southerns. They're much more like stand their ground, confident. Tandem bars won't stand their ground quite so long. They'll they'll take off the other direction a lot quicker. Um, that's that's what, what at least what I found with my wild caughts. But I, I'd have to imagine that that captive bred tandem bars, especially if you, you know, you raise them, you know, where you're interacting with them and you're holding them while you clean them and whatnot. I, I have no reason to think that they wouldn't go the same way as, you know, barn X and, and whatnot. You know, I, I don't really want to add more big snakes to my collection only because I, I can only do so much, you know, but like for me, there's definitely a, a lure to, you know, the tannin bar route or the home of hair route. Yeah. Which I've always thought Homa Harris were cool, but honestly, until I saw some of the shit you posted, I was like, Ooh, dude, you've got some homes over there that are built different. I, I, I do, and and uh I can't take full credit. Uh two of the pairs that are here are belong to Chad Brown. He's kind of he has them on, on breeder loan with me. They're okay. uh, they're animals that that he got from Cameron at Bushmaster directly as babies and, and raised them all up there. They're stunning, but I mean, my my Helma Harris are, are aren't bad either. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like for the longest time, you know, the they were just like though they're different shades of brown, and uh, you know they can be, but not entirely. I mean, you know, uh, Shane Adamson has posted some of the ones that uh, that he's produced up in the the Somalia, the new Somalia group recently. They're just, I mean, my jaw hit the floor. They're like screaming gold yellow. They're incredible. I mean, I think the the color palette within Halma Harris is, is quite a bit more diverse than we probably give it credit for. Well, and I feel like if you look at what we were able to do with jungle carpet pythons and yeah. turning them from, you know, brown and black snakes to bright, bright bright yellow you know to put just a little bit of effort into Halma Harris and you know fast forward to three generations the selective breeding potential that's been untapped there is insane yeah I mean that, I think that's actually a really great comparison and I haven't even thought about that until you until you said it but I mean yeah I, I think that that's probably as close as of a comparison as, as you can you can get. Even in the F1 animals that that like we're seeing from from Shane, uh, you know, I was lucky enough uh, back in the fall um, at the Milwaukee Zoo, I was able to interact with one of the uh, or two of the babies that were from the Oklahoma City Zoo clutch back from what was 2019 or 2018. Oh, and the ones Blake assisted with. 
Yeah, and though I mean they were incredible. They had this like orange base coloration that I've only really seen in in Barnex. Um, they were just I mean absolutely stunning. Yeah, people don't put enough respect on the Hans, man. No, and uh, you know myself included. Otherwise, I'd have some. But, uh, <laughs> but looking I, I think at coming though. Yeah, I just you know, I, I've got you know so right now I've got the two point two Barnex, I've got okay. the one point one Southerns, I've got the one point one Malukins, and then I've got the one point one Waminas uh, that Ryan Young hatched. Okay, and cool. dude, I'm just I'm out of room. Sure, uh, you know, like at, at this point, like if I'm gonna keep holdbacks and if I'm gonna grow what I'm doing, like I. I can't really do it here and still yeah. be able to do all the geeked out stuff with enclosures that I like to do and want to do. It's almost like I would have to really sacrifice, you know, cage size if, if I wanted to keep going and yeah. I don't know, like luckily I have a job, so I don't, I don't feel like I need to, you know, like I, I can be cool and kind of play in the realm of what I got without having yeah. to collect them all. But, you right. know, there's definitely a little guy on my shoulder, like, just buy it, just buy it, you know, and it, it's going to be even worse once I actually hatch some of this shit and to try to decide not to hold any back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when, when those first barnicks pop out over there, you are going to have a hard time being like, I'll sell you, 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 and you. That's that's not an easy day. I can tell you that much. Uh, I know I'll keep a pair and I'll figure it out. But, uh, dude, Cash's room, my son's room is going to be like, I'll have a wall of cages in there next. Watch. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's, how, that's how it goes. Before we move on, uh, I wanted to show this. This is that that tannin bar mail. For, Damn. For anybody who is curious. So, I mean, he's just... The, the tail is very purple in, in person, but yeah, like he's basically orange and purple. Yeah. It's, so this for everybody, this is what should be considered normal. This is, this is what they're supposed <laughs> to look like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's the, I mean, it really is the rarest phenotype. I mean, it's either patternless, it's exantic or it's exantic patternless. It, you know, it, it's so hard to find that. You know, and and honestly, dude, like I, I'm I'm really getting to the point to where like I don't want that many morphs in my collection, and I'm I'm moving away from things other than wild type animals. You know, I I, I really sure. am. You know, like uh, if you can't do it through selective breeding, and if it's something that's like a recessive trait, or if it's an incomplete dominant trait, I kind of don't care anymore you know yeah i feel like that's kind of that, that that's like an evolution of of being a keeper especially once you get into some of the stuff like we're talking about just you you just appreciate the the natural beauty of of the animal more than the genealogy potentials or you know whatever like it just it feels less authentic to me i mean that's i might be a but might be a weird way to say it but i don't know to me any any like of my line breeding projects that i have in my head with scrub pythons you know, they, they excite me a lot more than, you know, some morph project that I have been in, in the past. Dude, exactly. You know, like I've got my pattern list, which, what do you think about pattern list and like how that's going to play out? You know, I mean, it hasn't been proven recessive yet necessarily. Has it, have you proven it recessive? I don't even know. No, no. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I guess, my i would be curious where those patternless animals are coming from um like you know like like the you know you have like the patternless highland type looks where they're kind of like orange with a little bit of speckling but like the patternless southern mm -hmm. like that solid tan look the one that's like very distinctly different than you know like a regular pattern maruki um yeah. you know are those animals coming from the same places as the patterned animals uh you know i i don't know um because wasn't one wasn't your male patternless who produced your clutch yeah but i almost don't want to call him patternless anymore i used to call him patternless because everybody else called him patternless but now i kind of want to call it reduced pattern there was still a little Be bit of something going on 
Well, yeah, because you can see, you know how with the pattern list, you can still see like a little stripe across the top, kind of. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You can still see like just, just a little bit of pattern that's there. And that's what ended up developing in the offspring because, you know, uh, okay. I don't know, like a third of my offspring ended up uh, having that pattern list, reduced pattern look going on. Hmm. And, cool. you know, like, but I have seen true pattern lists and I feel like there's a difference. Yeah. I don't know if that's a variation of the same thing or if it's uh, uh, maybe it's het. It seems, seems to be a spectrum. Exactly. Maybe yeah. It yeah. Don't it. yeah. So like I, I have a male patternless Southern that that is truly fully 100% patternless. Um, so, you know, I, that's that's just something that I think it'll it'll come with time. I wouldn't be shocked if 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 there was some sort of a recessive nature to it, it just, it is always curious to me because so many of these different color pattern variations seem to just repeat themselves in the wild on a relatively frequent basis. Um, you know, like the pattern list, like the anery axanthic kind of look, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be all, all too uncommon compared to like that T positive barnick where there's only been, been one of them. Um, so I, I don't, we'll, we'll see, but I mean, to me, some of the patternless stuff doesn't really excite me so much. I, don't get me wrong. I like it, but like, okay, it's like breeding olive pythons. You know, I have olive pythons. I love them, but I don't need 40 olive pythons. You know, <laughs> I have a pair of waters just for fun. Yeah. I remember you, you remember you showed me them at Pomona, but like I have 40 bar necks and, and not no two of them look alike. Um, right. It's Brandon. Isn't it recessive? I mean, I don't think that's been proven, um, dude. I don't think I don't think enough breedings have been yeah. done to like on paper fully check the box. I think we all think it's recessive. I mean, that's just yeah. generally accepted. But the breedings, I don't think have actually been done to prove it yet. I mean, Brandon, if, if you know more, you know, type in another comment. We'll put it up on the screen. Um, but uh, I mean, because they, you know, when Nick, Nick has produced them, Ryan mm -hmm. has produced them. Was Eric Hernandez produced them last year? Like they, there have been a number of reproductions. Chris, yep, Chris produced them, and he got a lot of pattern animals out of out of that clutch. Um, Did his come from patternless animals though, or were his adults patterned? Uh, I don't his, remember. His female was was azanthic patterned, because I, 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 I remember she was fucking huge too. She's like nine feet long. Um, she's a big girl, and I, I want to say the male was too. I want to say it was an axanthic pattern to an axanthic pattern. Um, did he get all axanthic by any chance? I'm. I think he did get all axanthic. I'm, I'm almost positive, but I think he got some patternless too. So, yeah, I think. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean probably, but that could also just be a, th a thing of that recessive gene it was just prevalent. It became prevalent in the wild and kind of became the new normal where the the heterozygous form in, in true genetic terms of the pattern became less common because all these animals are carrying the double copy of that, that patternless gene. Um, I, I, I wonder what the point is. I wonder why there are so many of them, you know, and I and also, you know, the normal wild type ones, it's like evolution is just battling. Like, do we want to stay patterned or do patternless survive? And there's this like ongoing, fight for you know what it's going to be in the future you know that's kind of the way i think about it i, I tend to ask the, why the the xanthic versus the axanthic is an interesting one to me uh too because like this snake doesn't seem like it would blend in anywhere you know but that, but it was wild caught as an adult so obviously you know it did just fine and, and so did did plenty um so ryan's last post said that it, it proved out well, if it's if Ryan proved it, Ryan proved it. Yeah, let's go, Ryan. Can't tell him he's wrong. So that's that's cool. Yeah, I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> but, <laughs> but dude, have you ever tried figured, arguing with Ryan? I have not, and I figured I probably won't try to because I don't think that's you know what's you know what's really fun is what's watching that? Nick and Ryan argue. Oh, I could imagine. We, I, we need I to make them be on a podcast together just so they can disagree about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, dude! If you want to, if you want to do it, let's fucking you know get them, get them together. We'll 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 get that going. Well, the two of us will be sitting back just like this the whole time. 
uh, and I'll have my smiley face on though, just like, ah. and then I'll poke the bear. I'll like throw. I'll just keep throwing topics out that I know pisses him off. I'm just, ah. <laughs> oh man! So, dude, yeah. the other thing I'm really excited about for you is you're you're like. I like the heavy bars in my bar next, sure. right? Yeah, and sure like that, that's what I've got. I've got heavy bars all over the place. And I have one male, he's real dark. He's definitely, you know, on the dark side. But dude, some of the reduced pattern bar necks that you're working with right now are just so sick, man. The, the, the bars just on the neck, but all the way the rest of the down, I mean, like bar neck. You know what I mean? Quite, yeah, quite literally. Yeah. That's... yeah I, I think I think they're so heavily slept on. You know, Patrick's here right now. He'll he'll sing the praises of reduced pattern barnex. But uh, like when I was first getting into them and you know seeing a lot of David Means old posts, all of it, you know, the, the, the animals he labeled man aquari were the ones that really caught my eye first, which is the ones that had very little to no pattern past the neck. Um, my my first scrub I ever got, I was. I bought it as a sarong and it has almost no distinguishable melanin past its, its neck. Um, but uh, I just, I don't know. They just look so like clean, just like those soft lines, like no real definition. I, I just, that's why I love bar neck so much is you can, you can go so many different directions with it. But uh, I had two particular females that I produced in 2022 are like, I mean, they literally don't have melanin past their neck. Um, I think that, uh, that's something that I, that I'm I'm pushing for going forward, and I think you know obviously the dark barred animals. That's where it's I mean the, it's hard to beat that, but I think that everyone's sleeping on those reduced pattern ones a little too hard right now. Dude, so what camp are you in? Because I'll tell you right now, I'm in camp that the you know the birdhead peninsula species, you know barneck type, are yeah. a different species than the southern type. And I don't agree that they should both be Amnestina. Where are you at on that? So I, I'm, yeah, I guess short answer, completely agree. I think that my classification, if, if I was Mr. Taxonomist would be in, in just splitting up Amethystina. I think that uh, the Northern types are a species. So everything that's North of the mountain range mainland. So Barnex, Waminas, everything that's north of the mountain range, I think that's one species. I think that Beox are a full species. And then everything south of the mountain range, Highland, Southern, Maruki, whatever you want to call them, all one species. And then I don't know enough about genetics and whatnot. The the Aru and the Key Island animals seem very, very Southern-ish to me where the Beox are, the, are most like Halmaharas. Um, so I don't know if if Key Island and Aru would be lumped into the lumped into the southern species. Um, otherwise, those would just be full species onto their own. But that's what's your take? That that's my take on it. Yeah, for I mean I don't know. I think my my, my Walminas are way different. I, I don't think I don't think they're the same. Um, at least not as you know. I mean, it, it there's just so many obvious differences to me with my between what my Walminas and my Strongs. I'd have a hard time grouping those together. Um, but, you know, Southerns are Southerns. The island stuff, who knows? You know, with the different genetic stuff that's happened with the, the complete carpet python book um, and, you know, figuring out that you've got Darwin's are the same as IJs or Poplin carpets. Like that's, they're the same species, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they did the work in that book to, to kind of figure that out. So, I mean, if you can be as far apart from Australia as Papua and still have the same species, then, you know, for the little Island types to, to be the same species, that, that makes sense to me, you, you know? Um, yeah. So oh, it, it's hard to say, but I, I definitely think that that at some point somebody needs to get their shit together. And uh, there, you know, it, I don't. You know what I will say though, the girls in scrub pythons are coming out strong, man, coming out strong. Uh, dude, what's her name? I'm sorry, uh, she's awesome. Al is it Alexandria? Yeah, Alexandra. Yeah, she's working. Yeah, with the crosses, dude. Those are heavy. 
those are heavy. Those things are freaking they, nuts. They, they draw some some controversial sides to the to the topic, okay. but I, I think that they're great. I, I really do like those snakes. Um, Alexa, turn on reptile room. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a hybrid and I don't, you know, I, I don't keep or want any hybrids, but, you know, I, I can't judge her for doing it. I really can't. And the fact that she pulled it off, I think is pretty cool. And yep. at first I like kind of looked at it a certain way, but then she posted the babies that, you know, are two years old now or whatever, year old. And holy shit. <laughs> I mean, Those you, are pretty you, snakes. You know, you, you can't talk shit about those snakes, but then also admire a diamond jungle jag or a designer green tree python. It's it's the same concept. Uh, it's just like mm -hmm. it's the first time that I feel like somebody has done it intentionally since scrubs have really started to become main more mainstream. Um, yeah. What I like is that they look they don't really look like a barneck or a southern. They, they look like their own thing. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know Alexandra, and I know that she's going to represent those animals for what they are. So oh, for that, I still don't see a problem with it. Um, you know, I, I hope that people don't go cross crazy. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd like crosses to be done like very intentionally, um, not just throwing two random scrubs together just for the sake of making more scrubs. Cause I, honestly, I don't think it's going to look that good if you take that approach. Um, but uh I mean, as long as it doesn't go down the path of the carpet pythons we're good because as you long know, as we still it, know what these animals are you're fine yeah it, it, exactly because we screwed that up with carpets and we have an opportunity not to screw that up with scrubs you know what but if a couple people are going to do it occasionally they're going to get animals like that and they're doing the designer thing you know just like in condros bro you got your designer camp you got your locality camp and everybody can hang out at a party be friends and drink beer so you know whatever whatever gets you going yeah so i mean i i i see no problem with it and i also think that just with the amount of care and attention she puts into those animals they're very high quality animals uh, uh, from above all else you know that if you get one of those scrubs for your collection you have a very very high quality healthy scrub python and uh i think as you know as, as breeders as propri proprietors of these snakes that's the main goal at the end of the day you know is to give people good experiences especially considering the the stigma that that scrubs have carried for so long that i feel like anybody who's kept him for a, a period of time knows this is just totally false, uh, you know, for the most part. See, I bounce back with you on that. Cause I don't think it's totally false. I think it's, it's a good range. Now you have way more scrub pythons than I do. I get it. But like, I've still got a decent percent that fucking hate me. You know, I've got my, my male Southern loves me. He's great. He's fantastic. Super easy. Not a problem. The female's a bitch. My male, uh, uh, Wamina, extremely chill. His name's Darkness. He's a great snake. He, my son holds him all the time. He's fantastic. My female's a bitch, you know, like <laughs> with the Barnex. Uh, yeah. uh, one of them, 12 gauge is not cool. 12 gauge wants to, wants to bite you in the face. The other three are extremely cool and handleable and, you know, no problem at all. So, you know, I've got a good range of totally cool to cunt. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I love them all the same. And, and um, I do as well. I just, uh, the numbers are very heavily skewed towards the chill side. And of the captive bred animals, there's only one that I can't handle, and it's one that I acquired as an adult. Okay. That's so cool. I, I think that's where we're going to see a lot of progress as far as, and the same thing happened with retics. You know, I mean, if you hear, People like Kevin McCurley talk about the old days of, of import retics. These big adult wild caught retics that are getting were total monsters. Mm -hmm. Breed them out a couple generations and now they become more accustomed to captivity and to human presence. And I think it, it's I think they're gonna work the same as, as any other snake. They're not these heat seeking demon missiles that they've been made out to be. They're just they're just snakes. No, yeah, no, I, I do. I do agree with that a hundred percent. And I mean, just there's, there's variety in all of it. Carpet pythons, you know, the majority of mine are fine. A couple of them are going to get you, you know, and that, that's just what it is. Yeah. 
That's just and if you can't appreciate that, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for that, but you know, I my uh, my favorite is when you know somebody gets a scrub python from me, and a day or two later they're like, "This animal's so chill. I wasn't expecting this. This is like my new favorite snake." Like that 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 to me is everything because that's that was my experience when I was first getting into it. And I remember how how much that changed the trajectory of my keeping. So I'm like, if I can if I can provide that experience for for somebody else and like such a positive first foray into a new a new group of species, that's that's everything for me. That's like that's why that's why I do it, you know. Oh yeah. No, it's it's a blast, man. I love this, you know, lifestyle honestly you know because the whole my whole world revolves around these these rooms you know all my spare time it's a battle between hobby and family you know and i you know now i love it because i used to have to decide am i hanging out with my wife or am i cleaning cages and now you know i've been with my my six-year anniversary was the other day we've been together 10 years finally my wife follows me around while i'm cleaning cages <laughs> It took forever, dude, but I got it. I'm there. I can do both at the same time now. I just learned that I was wild caught. So this is this is actually kind of breaking down my my worldview right now. So I'm I'm pretty upset by this. But is that your dad? That's, that's my dad. Just <laughs> dropping the bomb that I was a wild caught. Uh, dad, for the record, which which country was I imported from? I, I would like to know. Um, but uh you know yeah. there, there's a lot happening in scrubs though man i think there's gonna be more and more and more scrub pythons available on the market than probably ever you know here within these next five years uh you know um there there's yeah. enough people that are doing it now to where getting captive born and bred scrubs is no longer a dream it's very much a reality you've been spearheading a lot of it dude i'm proud of you but you know there's a lot of other people that oh, are, yeah, that are it's a lot too. Too. most certainly and you know we went from there being one scrub python clutch or two scrub python clutches in the u.s every year to you know now you need yeah. two hands to count it and going on up you know and uh, you know and they're never going to be what are you looking at oh north korea <laughs> i'm the tallest person who was ever born in north korea apparently <laughs> no that's yeah, freaking I, awesome all right dad you're disrupting the podcast uh, <laughs> yeah so no, yeah I'm, man like so I'm, like i'm, I'm just on that way. i'm just happy for the species for that you know yeah like they're they're generally being accepted and wanted and learned about and asked about and they're not the naughty stepchild anymore and uh i mean shoot same thing with maclots pythons remember when everyone hated maclots pythons and yeah, no one no one talked about them they were just they were an afterthought yeah they were they were i, I sold them for 60 bucks a piece dude no one wanted them it was hard to give them away i traded them for feeders you know, uh, it, it was, and now every, they're all puppy dog, chill, freaking animals, you know? And like, it's just been fun watching the hobby evolve and just be a part of it, dude. you know? Yeah. No, I, I mean, and I've, I've been around a lot, a lot shorter of a time frame than, than you have. And I, I've even liked what I've seen, uh, you know, in the last 10 years in particular, um, I think the the move towards diversity within collections, you know, I think that's what's going to keep the the hobby going forward and you know keep us from from stagnating is is you know different different new trends popping up here and there, different things for people to you know be be interested in and you know try their hand in. You know, I've got to say this uh, movement for for bigger caging and. And it's funny, if you look hard enough, you will find podcasts of me cussing at people who say enrichment <laughs> because I, I it hurt my ears to listen to, you know, it was like, enrich and it was like this brain nubbing, like, fuck off enrichment people, you know, yeah. and, and now it's cool right you, you know and, and i and i appreciate it and there's this like young army of like really well-meaning keepers that are that are growing and like 
pushing this perspective out and, and man you guys do your go you guys you know um I'm all for it. I just I appreciate the animals so much more when I can watch them be animals and do snake. I like watching snakes do snake things. You know, it, it hasn't always been like that, but like you know, now I'm I could fit like because I have two reptile rooms. Okay, I have my main room and I have my basement, and I can fit every single animal that's in my basement in my main room if I want to, no problem, and I have a whole nother room to fill stuff up in. But no, dude. You know, like at some point, just I don't know. I don't know. It's a balance. It's a balance. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's another thing that just kind of comes with with a, you know, an individual's kind of personal evolution in it, especially, you know, in generations past, a lot of the people who, anyone was first exposed to were the large scale breeders, primarily ball pythons or leopard geckos, colubrids, where it's just, you know, rows of racks. And that was, that was the dream. That was what was pitched as the dream. And, uh, and, you know, I'm, animals are healthy in, in that type of a setup. Um, it's Dude, hard. You know, what was before that though? Before Big enclosures. <laughs> <laughs> so before everyone had their snakes and racks and bred everything in racks and did this whole thing that was it didn't exist there weren't there, once upon a time there were no racks and everyone kept their stuff in big massive radical enclosures and then they had trouble breeding things and right. the ball python thing hit and it shrunk down and breeding you know dude when you got nothing else to do you're hanging out in iraq you're down to bang you know what i mean like there's nothing else going on you're right there like you know the most one of the most successful carpet python breeders ever it was todd with carrie mm -hmm. king and psychotic exotics yeah. and i have never met a person more talented at sticking two snakes in a tub and getting them to produce a clutch of eggs it works you know like you can't argue the fact that it, there, there are results. I bet if we kept our scrubs in tubs, they would breed way more frequently than the people that are keeping them in big cages. I think it's a more successful way to breed. But then I don't get to wake up in the morning and come in the reptile room and watch them drape across a branch. Right. And man, everything looks cooler on a branch. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that to a degree. I think if it was as easy as that, let's just let's let's start throwing our Bolins pythons and CB seventies, you know. Um has anyone tried that yet? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe that's that's the next uh next evolution. Um but I think that the I think the downfall of the big enclosures is just not being able to secure the parameters the proper way um, because you have so much space, you know, they're, they don't have the proper basking or the, this or the, that. So I think if you can, if you can do the work to bridge that gap in that naturalistic setup, then, then that's where, you, where the success will come. Um, and I think it's also about having animals comfortable in, in their environment above all else. Dude, but, Focus uh, Cube figured that shit out, right? Respect to those guys. There's some innovators over there. They have some pretty good, great products over there. I definitely, I definitely like those enclosures. They're they're very, very cool. Oh man. Um dude, so yeah, like on to the whole like snake in the branch thing. Like, I'm with you. They they gotta be comfortable. Everybody's gotta be cool. But you know, we have to decide why we're doing this. And you're either doing this for fun, you're producing, you know, whatever your, your kick is. It's how many eggs can yeah. I get? How much stuff can I breed? How many species can I breed? Oh my god, I need to pay my bills, I need to make a living, you know, sure. like I I need to get you know, this multi-gene thing going, but I have to hold everything back in order to do it. And, you know, there's all these different reasons for goals. And uh, did you see the Ron St. Pierre thing yesterday? No, I haven't to watch it Man, yet. 
Dude's got like 60 emerald tree bows he's keeping outside. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> you know? I mean, so freaking cool. I'm I have my diamonds outside and I'm mm. I'm I I don't know how it's gonna go still. I've been doing it for two years now that they, they've been outside, and I, I still don't know this year on whether or not I'm gonna get a clutch. Mm. I don't know. But they're old. They're like 20. So, um, you know, that has something to do with it as well. Sure. Uh, but, man, talk about, like, just being able to push something to the limit. Like, those diamond pythons are so freaking impressive. And, you know, it can be 45 degrees outside, 50 degrees outside. Yeah. And they're, they're fine. They're completely fine. It doesn't make any sense. It's awesome though, and I like watching it. Yeah, I mean, what was the what was the genesis of that project for for you? You know, what, what where did the idea come from? How how was like the early stages of execution of that? You know, walk us through that because that's fascinating to me that that you do that, and you're in the perfect place for it in in, in the U.S. You know, you can't do that in many other places. Yeah, so um, I had a uh, a competing company that um I, I bid against all the time in my day job and the owner of that company uh drain mob shout him out great company uh <laughs> they uh he hits me up and he's like hey dude do you want this i know you like reptiles and he sends me a picture of this massive enclosure that was for his iguana and he was uh, moving out of his apartment into his into a house and he didn't have his iguana anymore so he wanted to go ahead and and give it to me so he sent his crew over and he dropped off this massive eight foot long three feet deep six foot tall cage in my backyard and i just needed to figure out what to do with it so oh, wow. at that at that point in time i had a diamond python and i'm like well fuck let's go <laughs> you know so it was total happenstance. I, I didn't really do it on purpose. Just one weekend, all of a sudden, I had this massive cage, and I needed to figure out what to put it in, and I, I had my heading. And um, they've been doing great. Uh, I, I do have an issue with the shade. It's too shady outside. I don't have them in a spot that's perfect. So mm -hmm. I add supplemental heat um, during the daytime because okay. they're in the shade so much during the winter that they can't naturally get up to temp the way that I want them to. Okay. So I have a big Husky tub outside with a 120 watt heat panel um, that's hooked up to a herp stat that I have kick on to like 85, 86 degrees during the day for like seven hours a day. And then after that, I've got it tuned down to like 50 degrees at night, something like that. I'd have to look as low as you can really set a herb stack. Sure. Um, and it, that, that's been perfect. So the trio's been out there for yeah, like two years. So it's, um, I don't know. I don't know if they'll breed, man. I hope so. I've seen them lock. Um, there, okay. There's a good possibility. I, I don't want to say anything's going to go this year because, you know, we were talking before the show. I'm so in the waiting game, uh, looking yeah. around cages. And I'm looking around my reptile room and I'm looking around at all these females and I'm like, holy crap, I might have the biggest year I've ever had or everything could go to shit. <laughs> and what? this is that awkward yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Or it'll be normal and half the stuff will go and it'll be a fine season like it usually is, which is what normally happens. You know, yeah. it's, you never totally miss. But uh, yeah, this is definitely that waiting stage where uh, I just have no idea what's going to happen. I don't. I can tell you my scrubs all look like they're gravid, but yet don't for different reasons. So okay. that's extremely confusing. All right. You know, they're in hide boxes like they normally never are. They're wrapped up like they normally never are. Mm -hmm. uh, only one of them's darker than normal. Maybe, maybe two. A couple of them still want to eat. Um, you know, so it's it's this like, man. I just anyway. Hopefully it works out. I'm I'm seeing that all over the place. I've got jungle carpets that look like they're going to go. Inland pythons this year look like they're going to go, which would be cool because it'll be the first time I've done inlands. And um, it would be nice to put inlands, inlands and diamonds. I would like to mark off the list, you know, 
Yeah. Uh, I'm not chasing Ryan Young or anything like that, <laughs> but I, I would like to hit a certain amount of species that I've bred before I exit this hobby. So, you know, anytime there's an opportunity to check something new off the list, that's cool. And um, anyway, we'll see. Maybe even water pipe. I don't know. Mm. I don't know, man. Does that encompass everything? Why that? Don't you like What's that? Why don't you like carpet pythons? I do like carpet pythons. I've kept carpet pythons. Oh, shit. How many do you have? I don't have any right now. I do not have any carpet pythons. I'm going to send you one. I'm going to give you a carpet python just so you say that, so that you have one. Will Did you, you accept a carpet python, Stephen? I'll accept an inland. How about this? Okay. Negotiations live on Kush's Corner. Let's do it. Brandon is kind okay. of riding me. You ready? Himself. I am ready. No, I'm giving it to you. I'm not bribing you with anything. Oh, this is a okay. gift. All right. My bad, my bad. You have to take good care of it, though. You're never allowed to sell it. And if you do sell it, you have to give it back to me. This is my last snake from la from this year. It is a pure gelatin locality jungle carpet. There are, to my knowledge, only four people, including me in the United States, that have ever produced these. They're rare, and they're freaking pretty, and they look exantic. I know this, you can't see it in the camera, but this is this is your snake. You're not allowed to not have a carpet python. Dude, you don't have to do much convincing for me to take a gelatin jungle. Those are some special snakes. I'm, I'm very familiar with, with what those are. You have to pay shipping, though. Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> wow. Well, I mean, dude, thank you. That's incredible. Yeah. No, I I remember some of those, uh, the old NPR episodes when they were talking about those and seeing some old pictures. And I, I you know, I love Azanthic stuff. I love Azanthic scrubs. And so that, that, that look of the rotten jungle, that's a special, special snake. They're cool, man. Honestly, I've just been too lazy to put this one on Morph Market, so I've never even really posted it up. <laughs> but, so yeah, so I guess since we're on the topic, what's what's the status of gelatin jungles in in the U.S. hobby right now? Uh, there's maybe a hundred of them that mm -hmm. exist. I mean, in the U.S., not that many. Um, Nick's done it. I've done it. Eric's done it. Nick's done it multiple times. Okay. There's quite a few people that have uh, animals that are breedable now that, you know, this is going to be the first year that they're, they're coming of age just from okay. the, you know, the first clutches that were produced. So I think we're going to see quite a few more of them in the future. Okay. It's just people haven't had time you know, outside of that first group, you know, that came in that Eric and Nick got, not a lot of people have had time to just really right. raise and breed those yet. So right. they're, they're, they're going to be more and more, um, right. you know, they're, they're, they're absolutely beautiful. I mean, they're very, very different from, yeah. from anything. And, um, you know, the technically now they're, they're very God, I believe they're considered the same thing as, you know, Darwin or pop one or IJ, oh, okay. but they're, but that would be like the southernmost area. Those would be found. Somebody mm. who knows a little more than me about that. Want to drop that on. Is that like right at the Northern no. range, range of Cheney Eye then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They've been called gelatin jungles yes. forever. But the DNA testing that was done in the complete Carpet Python book kind of stuck a fork in that. Hmm. Um, you know, that being said, they're super unique and, and just flat out different and yeah. uh, really should be more popular than they are right now. I, 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 you know, people should be kicking down the doors trying to buy these freaking things. I, I just yeah. think they're so, they're so cool, you know. So anyway, now you own one. Well, hell yeah, dude. I'm I'm very stoked. When did that first group come into to Nick and Eric? How long ago was that? Uh I don't know. I do what? know that mine were from the first group that Nick produced. Okay. And, and mine are five years old. Okay. Um so I'm not sure how much longer before that he had them. I know they, they came over, I believe, from Sweden, I think. I could be wrong. I'd have to check the uh, 
I, I'd have to check the lineage chart, but they did come over from Europe. And um, yeah, anyway, they're they're freaking rad. There's some a lot of cool locality stuff. That, some of it's dying, dude. Some of it's just not going to make it. You know, yeah. Fort Douglas coastals. I don't think we'll ever see those in Mojave. Really? I don't think they're gonna. Yeah, I, I don't think they're gonna come back. Tolies, um, Tolly jungles, dude. There's everyone's bred Tolly. You know the the animals that were pure Tolly. You know locality jungles just ended up getting bred to other jungles. So you know that locality's lost. Rockhamptons are still going strong. Uh, Rockhampton coastals. Yeah. are still doing their thing you know there's plenty of brisbane locality coastals out there um you know there you can definitely get your get your feet wet with carpet pythons dude i think carpet pythons are the perfect snake for anybody who's not into snakes and wants to get into snakes and do something different than a ball python and want yeah. something with a little more action maybe think scrubs are interesting but you want to make sure you know, I, I really feel like before any like if you've never had a snake before and you're like, holy crap, I love scrub pythons. A couple of years hanging out with a carpet python first isn't going to be the worst thing for you. Definitely That's good all. preparation. Yeah, that'll kind of get you into a lot of the harder arboreal stuff. They're a great place to practice. Yeah. So so let me ask you this question, and this might be either a little controversial or, or a little deep, but I, I think this is a good top place to talk about it. Why didn't carpet pythons take off? I feel like they were poised to, it was ready, and then just flatline. They're ugly as babies. They are pretty as adults. So when you have an ugly looking, snappy baby that just wants to bite and is a drab color, then mm -hmm the normal person at a reptile show is going to walk right past it and go look at the super pretty bright ball Python. That's just going to get uglier with age. Sure. So, you know, it's, it, it, you know, <clears throat> until the carpets are a year or two old, they look like shit, dude. And I, I think that's really hurt. And kind of like with the scrubs, you know, carpets have had this reputation of being super mean and bitey. It's not true. It's not true at all. I know. Um, yeah, you know, but you got to get past them being a baby first. You got to get through the snappy. You got to get through the skittish. You know, you got to let them grow up with you and, and, and work through it. Dude, my adults are all so freaking cool. Uh, you know, people just have these misconceptions about these animals that just aren't fact. So I think that definitely has a part of it. Okay. Um. The morphs took a long time to come around and there, there haven't been as, as many morphs, you know, that, so, you know, if you're going to go morph crazy, you can a little bit, but you really have to, you're creating hybrids at that point. Yeah. So you got to be cool with that too. Sure. You know, it's just, I don't, I don't know what it is. They caught me, man. Ever since I saw Steve Irwin get bit in the face by one, when I was like 11 years old, <laughs> I've been hooked ever since. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they are incredible snakes and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they're not more popular. Um, I feel like, you know, my reaction to the first point you made is just, why not just keep them until they're eight to 10 months old before you start advertising them and make when they actually start to look good. A lot of guys are doing that. A lot yeah. of guys, I'm impatient. Um, but that is the way, you know, take a page out of the condo keepers guide, right. Um, you know, wait till it kind of turns green, go ahead and throw that, that, that gotcha question. MJ just taught me. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. I wanted to make sure that you were cool. with it. All right. Is it true the majority of carpet python keepers have NIDO? MJ, it is true that the majority of python keepers have NIDO. This is not a carpet python thing. You, you know it as, as well as I do. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely saw um, carpet pythons take a hit with NIDO, you know, right after we saw the chondro keepers take a hit with NIDO. It, it kind of happened simultaneously. And... Um, it definitely changed for me the way I work with my room, you know, um, I can tell you babies come first and then I work with the adults. 
you know my yeah. adult my adult i don't have any adult carpet i don't have any carpet pythons up here at all except for babies that i've produced that i'm not keeping anything that i'm keeping gets to move down into the main room once you're down in the main room you're not coming back upstairs that being said i don't have anything sick down there i don't have any respiratory i don't have anything going on everything's fine but you know, I, I'm really, really careful to always work from youngest to oldest as far as animals and anything that is hatched and produced and potentially for sale. Those get worked with first, maybe even on a different day. You know, I'll, I'll kind of stagger it out to where I do one room one day, another room another day. Yeah. Order of operations. Thank you. You know, there, there, there there's a way to deal with it. Um, but yeah, if you have a large python collection then absolutely yeah dude you there's nido somewhere for sure yeah i mean that's definitely uh in, unless you have your entire collection mm -hmm. tested animal by animal and you're a, a python keeper or breeder you can't claim you don't have it you know because yeah. you you don't know and, and many species will be fully dormant with it where they'll be contagious they'll have it they just they'll never show any symptoms it at least the strains that seem to be most prominent primarily affect green tree pythons and, you know, secondarily carpet pythons. Yeah, dude, it sucks. It, that, that was some bullshit when that hit, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, but Hey, at least we had an answer. Yeah. I mean, it, it could have been IBD where the answer is you chop all your snakes heads off. Like, you know, it, it, it for all things considered, nidovirus is not, as bad as it could be i think we all no, should be it was kind of like the COVID of of reptile i mean quite literally <laughs> the makeup yeah. of the virus is a very similar virus to 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 COVID in humans um pretty much but uh but yeah so i guess yeah we we got we got gotcha but uh you know it, it just it is the case unfortunately but luckily through quarantine and separating animals and you know working animals the way that you described it can be completely circumnavigated you know yeah you know i will say I, I i don't test babies unless um somebody who's buying a snake asks me to and if you want to pay for the test i'll totally test whatever i don't care it's fine yeah. but and i when i have you. sent yeah but when i've sent adults out i've tested my adults before sending them on my own dollar True. um you know like if, if i've got an adult that i know specifically has definitely lived in like multiple different places and then it came to me and and, and whatever i i'm i'm gonna test that just for my own fucking sanity before yeah. it gets put in the mail it's not that much money just to do one snake you know what i mean 100 bucks cool if i'm gonna test everything that's gonna cost me like four grand i'm not gonna do that no but if something needs to go somewhere else i'll totally throw a swab in its mouth first yeah so this is another interesting comment. So one of the biggest issues that now people blame NIDO for non-NIDO issues, facts. Paramyxo is common and way more scary. There's all kinds of shit that kills snakes. Dude, cancer kills snakes, man. Tumors kill snakes. You, you know, know, viruses kill snakes. Stupid keepers kill snakes. You know, uh, thermostats failing kill snake it, it, these are animals man they die that's why it's scary to invest a lot of money in it yeah you just you know you got to be aware of it and then you have to take the right steps of you know making sure that you're doing the best to protect your animals from from anything and you know protect protect your collection protect animals that you intend on sending to other collections you know slowly over time it'll just it'll just decrease in general you know throughout collections Dude, 100%, 100%. 100%. And, you know, I, I love watching the ebbs and flows of, of popularity. It was far as the species is concerned. Yeah. You know, to get, get, get off the matter of topic. I, I, like, I like watching, you know, diamonds, dude. Diamond pythons. Have you seen how much diamond pythons cost now? Tell me how much cost now you know, they're like hey, you're gonna spend two grand on a male 2500 you know some Damn. somewhere in there they're yeah. you know and, and and people aren't producing as many of them anymore inlands like you said you're like dude you give me an inland you give me an inland people are talking about inlands you know people are, people are 
You used to have inlands? I bred inlands. You bred inlands? I bred inlands in 2020. When was that? They, they hatched like two weeks after my bar next did, so I don't think anyone really knew. But uh, but yeah, in 2020, I bred inlands. What line? They're a mog line that I got from, from Todd. So Okay. Yeah. I have their father. Hell yeah. I That's have it. the original Mog line male that started the Mog line here in my basement. He belongs to Nick, but he's at my house right now. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. He's a dick. Interesting. Yeah. He's not nice. The female's sweetheart, cupcake. Most inlands are super chill. Inlands yep. have got to be one of the most relaxed, you know, species ever but this like 20 year old fucker downstairs man he is a crotchety grouchy old snake <laughs> luckily though he's also horny and is still getting down hell so, yeah that's awesome yeah 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 sometimes those older males they uh they they lose the lose the will at a certain point in time for sure. That's what I'm afraid of with a couple of things that I, I have around here, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, I just feel fortunate to keep what I keep and, and have what I have. And, um, fucking MJ has got me hooked on Emerald tree bows. Now that was his fault. It's not hard. <sighs> to do. Yeah. So those are what I'll be spending money on in the future is right. I need more of those. So Yanni emeralds, no, not anymore. But that's another basins. I, I would do basins again. I, I think northerns are are not in my future, but I I definitely would do basins again. You're one of those guys, aren't you? I, I've been traumatized by northern emeralds. No thanks. Well, you. tell me a story. What happened? Um, I mean, for for a handful of reasons, but but one thing that really particularly sucked was uh, had a had a gravid female go full term slug out and die five days later. <sighs> that was a bitch and uh yeah. another thing that just sucked was like back in like 2018 2019 seeing forests get in dozens and dozens and dozens of wild caught emeralds i mean literally every single last one of them died like it was just like oh god damn it's just you know it's it's i feel like at a certain point you know, like for, for me with a Bronia, a similar, similar thing, you know, babies were super difficult to establish. So just seeing dead baby after dead baby, trying to do everything for those animals. Uh, it just, it, it, it wore on me to the point where I'm like, I don't really care to do this anymore. You know? Okay. That's fair. That's kind of like my Condor story. Yeah. That's why I don't have green trees is I, I went through that with green tree pythons, you know, yeah. I, I, I got a, my first green tree. Um, I, I got it from the reptile shop I worked at. It was a fresh import. It, it immediately was jacked and, uh, you know, I went to the vet and tried all stuff and it didn't matter. So and, um, then I put a pair that I kept that, again, died. And that is because I had an air conditioning malfunction and I didn't have them on a thermostat. I was using heat lights at the time. And that was before I was using thermostats and heat panels. So the AC went out, the cage got hot, killed the pair, raised them up all the way to adults. They were yeah. in the cage yeah. to breed and, yeah. and killed them. And then I bought another pair from a buddy. This is all over the span of like 20 years, 15 years. And, and I got another pair from a buddy, had those for like two years. And I ended up uh, giving a male to a friend because a female died. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's because she was egg bound. Yeah. So like I give up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's, you know, there, there's some things in this hobby. We learn the wrong way, you know, but we got to learn it. And that's yeah. why I think these podcasts are so cool is because I've learned so much through other keepers experiences on here. And, um, you know, I, I think sharing stuff like this with new people that haven't had an opportunity to find it and see it yet is, is just, invaluable like the keepers that we are raising up right now in this hobby are, are going to be so many levels ahead and yeah. uh 
and I'm here for it. If we can just keep the, the laws at bay and fish and wildlife off our backs, then uh, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of pros and cons of the internet into social media, but the, the biggest pro is just the ease of access to information. And uh, the biggest con is the amount of complete crap information. So, you know, when we can, when we can put good information out there. I, I think it's kind of our, almost our responsibility is, is people who have that ability to, to do that. Um, you know, because I, I, I love to be able to, you know, teach people about mistakes that I made and mistakes that I saw other people make that I didn't need to make. Um, you know, because that's, like you said, that that's how we, that's how I move this forward. And uh, another thing that I, I really kind of enjoy about the way everything exists today is that like with stuff like what like chondros and emeralds and things that I've kept that I, or carpets that I don't keep anymore. Um, I just, I like to be able to see other people who are doing it at the highest level, you know, cause for me at this point, if it's not a if it's not a scrub python or or a rattlesnake or a gelatin jungle, like I I have a hard time justifying bringing it into the house, um, just because I only have so much space and so much time, really in less space, more time that I I in like mental bandwidth to dedicate to these animals. Um, so being able to like observe people who are treating their emeralds the same way that I treat my scrub pythons is really cool because I can't do it both, you know. Hundred percent, hundred percent, dude. I'm having fun with my emeralds. I've got it set up yep. all wonky, and uh, I did it. So I've got them in. So I've got one, like one northern and one basin, and, and they're each in two okay. by two by twos. It's uh, those right there, and okay. I've got them. Uh, you know, I, I, there's no bedding at all on the bottom, so completely beddingless. And I've got the pothos plants in there going hard. I've got drains hooked up to the enclosures and I've got them on a mist king setup to nice. where they're getting rained on like twice a week for two or so hours at a time. Oh, wow. And, and uh, it's so cool. I don't know. I was just bored. I wanted to geek out and I had the snakes and I had this idea about like what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. And, you know, so I, I was listening to Ron St. Pierre last night and it, it, I almost felt like justified. I'm like, yeah, yeah, hydration, hydration. You know, he was, he was going off about it. And, um, I don't know, dude, I want to do more of that shit. Yeah. You I, know? I mean, your, your setups are awesome. And that, that was, you know, one thing, one thing I want to talk about was, was your experience with those animals. But yeah, I mean, I think when you can, when you can do something like that for, for your snakes, that's like taking what we're doing to the next level. It's just about having fun, being creative, but like being the uh, Eric Burke says it all the time, man, student of the serpent, mm -hmm. you know, learn, learn, learn from the snakes watch the snakes listen to the snakes pay attention to the snakes they're they're gonna tell you what they want and what they yeah, need they as soon as you learn to listen mm -hmm. and you know you're gonna learn more from your snakes than you will a podcast that much is for sure that is definitely um, true. That is you know true. so can i tell you about my retake enclosure please do it is just getting started i'm geeking out so I have Peaches. Peaches is my retic that was a gift. Uh, she is the only reptile I own that I do not want to breed. So I have no intention on ever breeding Peaches. She is a pet. And I love this snake so much, dude. She's like a puppy. And um, she, she, she pushes, though. I've got her in a, a six by three by by eighteen, and she the the cage kind of sucks because there's the space in between the the lip for the bedding and the sliding glass, which she can kind of stick her face right there and try to um, get out, and, you know, and and really jack up her face. So you know, I've had some some issues with that, and got her on antibiotics, and I ended up keeping her in a tub setup for a while. And, you know, took her out of where she was at, cleaned all the bedding out of there and put her on paper in a CB70. You know, she's like six feet, six and a half feet, got her in a freaking CB70 tub where she's not pushing. <sighs> Soon in the serpent, student in the serpent. Anyway, uh, so uh, recently I just took her out of the tub and put her back in her enclosure, but I'm building her adult cage in my basement. All so. Right. 
I've got it set up to where I got a floor drain installed in there and for the floor drain runs to a sub pump. And then I've got a uh, shutoff valve with a pipe coming up out of the ground that's connected to the sub pump that's going to be hooked up to a 60 gallon pond that I've got set in place. All right. And uh, I'm going to do a cool filtration setup where there will be like waterfall type thing going in there. Nice. And it's going to have concrete floor. And then I'm going to completely seal the entire enclosure. It's like 10 and a half feet long, like five feet, five and a half feet deep and like five foot seven tall because I can fit under it by that much. I'm five, six and a half. Um and uh so anyway I, I could barely walk in it but i'm not going to put any bedding in it at all okay um no bedding i just want to be able to power wash it i want to i want to have it sealed i want to get the concrete nice and sealed i want to have all the branches and i want to do all the shelves and i want to deck it out just to geek it out as much as i want to i don't think i'm going to do any kind of a rock background or anything like that though i don't feel the need to go all like super naturalistic with it i just want it to be cool yeah right that's an awesome I just want to, concept uh, dude it's gonna be so much fun I, I just want to sit in there with her and drink a beer and, and enjoy hanging out with her after i get off work you know <laughs> like, yeah not, that's, that's what this is about dude you know, it's just little stupid shit like that. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call that stupid shit at all. I think that's, you know, that's about as cool as it gets. Um, but yeah, your your basement project is something that I, I wanted to talk to you about. So uh, I guess for for anyone who hasn't seen what you've posted and whatnot, kind of give us a rundown of what you're doing with your basement right now. All right. So I bought my house a couple years ago and I had a crawl space and I dug 18 inches deep out of the crawl space and and then laid a four inch slab uh where I, then it flooded and i i had yeah, okay so I, I laid the slab and i was like yes and i can walk around down there i can clear under the beams by about this much so it's just my it's my size you know it's it's perfect you are gonna hit your head all over this <laughs> it. but it's perfect for me i built it for me and um i did like a block retaining wall where i wanted to stop digging i kind of ran into like plumbing and air conditioning and important mm -hmm. things okay. that stopped you know determined the, the size that th this was going to be so after i poured the slab dude the rains came and i got my ass kicked with water i had absolutely no idea how bad of a drainage problem i had in my yard but mm -hmm. my basement ended up with like four to six inches of water in it like it was up to the bottom of the enclosures after a rainstorm and i was just like oh fuck so what we did is uh excavated again uh dug down about four feet broke concrete you know dug down about four feet installed a sub pump and then when i installed the sub pump i'm like all right hold on that's when i decided to run the trench drains and do everything for this retick enclosure like that's where this whole yeah. idea was born and okay. uh, it's worked out great uh it, it, i'm not flooding anymore which is cool uh nice. but yeah turned a turned a crawl space into a reptile room and uh you know put put, put a sink down there you know right now i've got probably like 16 or so enclosures down there 20 enclosures okay. down there and um that's where i keep all of my carpet pythons and will be my, my, my retic so okay. um you know and dude there's so many people that breed retics like i just yeah sure i don't want to breed her man there's too fucking many there's too many because, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not saying this is what you have to do to keep a retick. It's not, you know, I've seen yeah. a lot of, I've seen a lot of people do a great job with, you know, the eight foot by four foot thing. And, you know, that, you know, and it's, and it's fine that, you know, they fit, but damn dude, there's just way too many people that get a baby and don't own a house and don't have a steady job and aren't ready. Yeah you know and like man retic people the, the breed retics need to do a way better job at, at deciding who to sell their snakes to like i'm sorry but 75 75 percent of you fucking suck and you'll sell to anybody who has the money to buy one and i think it's bullshit 
you know, like, like you need to really be careful on who is purchasing these animals, dude. They get freaking massive, dude. They're, they're dangerous. Like they get big and, and they're mistreated. It's, it's like, you know, Nile monitors, man. Same thing. Like Jesus Christ, you know, we've got the prices so low on retics, you know, you can buy one for a hundred bucks. You know, we treat them like throwaway animals. Like I feel terrible for those snakes, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree with you, um, and I, I think that's a product of of these markets being started for the sake of of monetary gain. Um, you know, instead of like, you know, take for instance like like green tree pythons. Um, you know, the, the first people who started breeding green trees were herpetologists and zoo, zoo curators and stuff like that, and they wanted to track the lineages and yada yada yada. Come. 30, 40, 50 years later, it's a much more sustainable market with people who have the right intentions behind these animals. Do they do everything perfectly? Absolutely not. You know, a lot of a lot of chondro keepers think if you don't use puppy pads, you're going to kill your animals with RI and yada, yada, whatnot. Those those emerald enclosures behind you are, are proof that that's complete crap. Um, but uh, but that, I think that 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 retake market it's, it's probably the biggest example of a market that was started just for the sake of capitalism and without the animals in mind at all. And it's, yeah. it's not tragic. Yeah. And I don't and like there's retic breeders who love their animals and do right by them. And then there's ones who are just purely exploiting animals. I just, can you just go breed ball pythons guys? <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> then you, you know like for your complexes with your 20 foot snakes you know but i mean there's some guys i respect too they're doing it well they're doing it right that have the capability of producing 20 clutches 25 30 clutches in a season but instead they're they're producing two right you know you guys are fucking awesome i yes. love you guys you guys are the shit you know because that's it's not about how many snakes you can produce. It's it's about how many good homes you can place them in. You know, uh, there there are how many new keepers can you bring into the hobby to justify what you're producing, and what are you doing to do that? You know, are are you are you are you introducing yourself to to people? Are you helping new keepers? Are you bringing people up? Are you mentoring people? <laughs> You know, because if you're not, you suck. I don't like you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that, that that's a, a blunt way to put it, but but it is true. You know, my my take is that I, I think, especially with how flooded, as a you know, you'd use it as just like a, a throwaway term. Flooded the market is how many breeders there are, how prevalent everything is these days with social media. I think we're moving into like the era of the boutique breeder, where a mass produ mass producer you're not making money anymore because your market is is so saturated that you know if you're selling 500 animals in a year and you're trying to get 3 to 500 bucks for for that you know you you're you're competing with with everybody else but if you are entering that market with 50 animals that maybe one to five other people can rival then you're in a situation to where not only can you charge more for that for those animals to actually make your money and run your business. But now you can actually do right by the animals and, and be a good example for people. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on how, I guess, on what I just said, and then kind of the future of, of what professional breeding will look like, so to speak. You know, some of the big guys have, have created monsters yeah. that need to be fed. You know, because you gotta feed the you gotta feed the beast, and it's just unmanageable. The like you said, the boutique breeder, the 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 the, the you know the guy who just wants to have you know a couple of really cool projects and, and take the time to do awesome videos about them and do the whole social media thing and and get people interested and get people excited. You know, that's the future of the hobby, like you said. You know what I mean? Um, do, doing it for a living, it's cool. And I love the people that have been able to do it. And I'm, you know, very much respect 
<clears throat> but if you're not creating 300 new keepers, then you shouldn't create 300 new snakes. That's that's the way I feel about it. Cool. And on a t-shirt. You know, and, and like I, I'm in a local reptile group, and it's it's really sad because it's uh Southern California reptile keepers. And there is a group chat for that group on Facebook, you know, and I, 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 I talk about snakes everywhere. Do people talk shit on Facebook groups all the time? I mean, all of them do. I love Facebook groups, but, um, in this group chat, you know, there's like a hundred active members in there and all they're doing is dumping their collections all day, all day. You know, all my animals are for sale on the low. Who's got what on the low? Who wants to trade for cheap? I got everything cheap. Who wants this cheap? You know, and out of the hobby and out of the hobby. And, you know, right now with the way that things have been going with the economy, the economy, man, I'm watching people dump their shit left and right. And uh, it's, it's depressing to me. It makes me visibly sad and upset <laughs> to see people... <clears throat> inviting animals to their homes just to freaking dump them dude and and it's you know it's a sad thing be be this is a commitment this is a lifestyle you know what i mean and uh i don't know i don't like quitters <laughs> yeah but i mean i i think you know take a look at in those groups what are those animals that you're seeing being dumped you know, what species are, are, are on those dump lists? Oh, God. It's a lot of ball pythons. It's a lot of ball pythons. It's a lot of bearded dragons. There's a guy trying to pretty much give away his berms today. Two big, beautiful berms. Uh, he was, you know, got to get rid of them. hundred bucks a piece, you know, come come get them, you know. And, and, it's, and it's every single day. It, it really yeah. is. It's, it, it's all the time. You know, and uh, I don't know. I, I just I, I want the hobby to be a good place and, and have a good future. But if everybody's just trying to make a money, make money, make a living doing it, and isn't just happy being like a hobbyist, what's up, Diesel? I, I think this comment sums it up very well. What we're what we're talking about. Yeah. It's half the COVID breeders realizing they can't make a quick buck. Those people never truly loved these animals to begin with, dude. You're right. You're a hundred percent right. And you know what? Take a year off breeding. It's it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Do you know how much respect I have for Eric Burke, dude? The pod father, right? Morelia Python Radio. That dude's got a massive collection and really doesn't breed anymore. Like he'll breed a little bit here yeah. or there. I, I think this year, I, I bet, I, I don't know how many snakes Eric has right now, but I bet he's got well over a hundred. And, and I think he's only trying for three pairings this year, which is like oh, wow. diamond. Yeah. I think he's trying two diamond Python pairings and like one or two other pairings. And that's wow. all he paired up. And, and last year he didn't beat anything at all, you know, cause the, the, the writing's on the wall guys, you know? And, uh, now I, I do think I'm going to have a good year this year. I think there's a good chance that I may be able to produce eh, seven or eight clutches of snakes, you know, That's awesome. but my inbox is also full of people asking questions all the time. Sure. And I've been able to cultivate, you know, enough people that are, you know, interested in this to where like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it. And, and it's that effort that counts, dude. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to scratch myself on the back, but like, fuck, dude, I'm just trying to do this right. Yeah, I, I think I think that's what it's going to come down to because, you know, and I was thinking about this earlier, but most of the time, especially with a new keeper, they're not really buying the animal. They're 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 buying the breeder or they're mm -hmm. buying the seller. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, think about in, in ball pythons. Do you want a clown pied or do you want a Cabelka clown pied or an Ozzy Boyd's clown pied or a Bob's balls clown pied. Like it's, 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 almost, I think it's more about the experience than it is about the actual animals themselves when it comes to a lot of, a lot of these transactions. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. 
especially if the, the, the force that's behind that sale is doing what you're saying of answering questions, guiding, advising these people, trying, you know, teaching them about the mistakes that, that they made. I, I think that's how you cultivate a uh, customer base is, is by providing that value to where when you're, when you're buying that animal, you're not just buying the snake, you're, you're buying the, you're buying the breeder, you're buying the experience of having an animal from breeder X. Yep. hundred percent, man. And you know who taught me that? Who's that? Nick, Mu Nick Mutton, dude. Nick taught me that shit, you know, cause I met Nick as a customer like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that dude is still, I am, I bug him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> i'm that i'm that customer in the inbox hey dude hey you know what i mean and uh and and he, he turned into the homie but it, it became like that because he was willing to answer the phone mm -hmm. he was willing to respond to the message you know he was willing to teach me he's busy he's always been busy but he's always been willing to, to step back and take the time to teach and, and at this point in my career doing this or, you know, time, I, I'm just trying to pass it on, you know, and uh, I, I don't know. You know, I see a lot of uh, people post in the groups asking this question and that question and like really basic stuff that should have been gone over from the breeder who they bought the snake from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's so hard because on one hand, I want to be super helpful and be like, sure, I am here to answer your question and answer the question. But then half of me been like, dude, who's the breeder? Like, why aren't right. you talking to you? You invested in this person. You know, why aren't they asking your why aren't they telling you what temperature to set your fucking thermostat at? <laughs> you know, like, these aren't hard questions. Who was your mentor? Who, who, who brought you? I mean. Oh, Morris, you'd say, right? I mean, but. it, it, I can't really give one because it's, it's all different, different points in, in time, uh, and kind of all for different purposes, different times. But, uh, my, my, my first mentor, uh, his name is Andy Sagan. He was a keeper back in Chicago who also happened to be my pediatrician when I was a kid. So, uh, that's cool. Yeah. So, um, and he he also was was heavily involved in the Chicago Herpetological Society, which ran Reptile Fest, which was basically like it, it was a reptile expo like any other, but it was purely educational, no sales at all. Um, okay. And, you know, I was running around there with my friends when I was five, six, seven years old, holding a bunch of snakes and iguanas and petting tortoises and stuff like that. Um, so that was like my first mentor. Mentor number two was Josh Beatty, who is a ball python breeder from the Chicago area and one of the OGs of podcasting. Most people probably don't even know the name Royally Addicted, but that was the second ball python podcast after Reptile Radio. And uh, he he actually, we did an interview when I was probably 11 or 12 years old at, at Reptile Fest that probably isn't on the internet, but, uh, but I've been doing this podcasting apparently since I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> But, but he taught me about like, you know, doing this professionally, how to run a business. Uh, he taught me how to palpate snakes, which is a trick that I have I have taken with me for for many, many years. And I've, I've used to very heavily to my advantage, um, obviously, forest fanning as well. You know, and I was like in the middle of high school about is when I met him and through him, I, I was able to meet so many other people, uh, people like Mark Bailey, who taught me damned everything I know about rodent breeding. Um, I mean, I, I could, I could keep going on and on. Uh, I mean, Kyle Vargas, uh, who is my mentor when it comes to the, the venomous snakes, rattlesnakes in particular, uh, Cody Bartolini, who I met through forest, who was the guy who really gave me my first like venomous snake training. Uh, I, I passed over it, but, uh, Rob Carmichael who ran the wildlife discovery center outside of Chicago, that's where I worked in high school. I was, you know, 14 years old, getting to play with adult olive pythons and green trees and seeing him work with Bushmasters and King Cobras and green mambas and crazy stuff, you know, alligators and crocodiles. I just, I've had a lot of people who have been there for me to, to kind of help me, help me through this, this process. And, you know, there certain, certain people came into my life at, at certain moments where it was like, 
uh, you know, that, that, that wasn't coincidence, you know, so this, so, something was, something put the two of us here on this day to, to make this happen. Like with Josh Beatty, the, the reason I met him was because he was at the table next to me at reptile fest. When I was like 10 years old, I wanted to bring my, my ball pythons to show to people because I had always been on the other side of the table and I wanted to vend. And I just, he had a new gene. It was the, the gypsy ball Python gene, which was one that he had got at a pet store, just like ran at a random occurrence. And he was like, this is a brand new ball python gene. And 10-year-old me was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was losing my mind. So, yeah, you know, probably a longer answer than, than you were expecting. But uh, no, man, you know, and, you know who have done a lot for me. I'm, I'm eternally grateful for it. You know, and I, and I try to look back at, at, at all of that, you know, pestering that I've done. And that's why I open my inbox and respond to the messages. Yep. You know, uh, that you, you got to pay it back, you know, and if, if you're if you're new and you're fresh here and, you know, you got one or two snakes, and you're just trying to figure that out. Re reach out to somebody, get get a mentor, because a lot of us are willing to do it. And once you've got a good thing going, though, you got to return the favor. You know that that's how we push forward. And I think that's why we're all here. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the pay it forward method is, is the only way because you, you can't repay your mentors for the information they give you. I mean, you could, you can do stuff like go help them clean enclosures and stuff like that, or, you know, drive the car when you're on a road trip so that they don't have to, or, you know, but like at, at the end of the day, they, they were in the same position when they were starting off with their, their mentor. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way that you are. I, uh, I, I try to respond to as many messages as I can, uh, especially now that this is, I mean, this is what I'm doing full time. Um, I don't have a reason not to. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll apologize retroactively back for, for, for about four years there when I was super busy all the time, I was not the best at answering messages. And I, if I've alienated you because of that, it's probably justified. So I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but now I, I, uh, I do everything I can to, get back to all the messages. And I, I, I love it too. I mean, that's, it makes me happy that people want to ask me questions and, and want to learn from me because it makes me feel like one, I've, I've done something right where I've gotten to the point where I, I can give this advice to people. And it also, it feels incredibly good to, to be able to pay it, pay it forward, you know, considering everything that people did for me. I remember meeting you at Herpeton when you were like, were you 18 or 19? I was 18. <laughs> Dude. You were so lit up. You were so excited and you were so just like eyes open, like, yes. You know what I, I mean? Was, I was like, exhausted too. I'd actually just, I had moved from Chicago to Indianapolis the weekend before for the sake of going to Herpeton because back when I first moved there, I would, I would drive out on, on Monday morning. I would, I would leave Chicago at like 4am to get to Indy for road and shipping and then like either Friday night or Saturday morning, I'd drive back to Chicago, take care of my animals all weekend. So to go to Herpeton, I, I obviously needed to, you know, I, I couldn't take care of my animals that weekend. So I had to move my life down <laughs> the weekend before Herpeton <laughs> just to be able to go. <laughs> it was crazy. That's awesome. That's awesome. That was a, that was a cool trip. I'm glad they're doing that again. There will be something like that Rami's putting on uh in a couple yeah. of months it's not ex i forgot what it's called mj do you know what it's called reptile talks is that what that event is it might be the reptile talks but they're they're, they're bringing it back they're doing something yeah. again soon uh mj might know somebody in the live chat what's it yeah. called uh anyway it, it it's in la and it, it's a couple of day like conference yeah you know and like man i learned so much in that conference i i was like get, getting to see guys like quetzal dwyer uh talk i wasn't wrong yeah. there you go reptile talk thank you brandon was it's a two, i, I mean you know and getting to drink scotch with scott stall you know what i mean and and talk about nido as a matter of fact and you know a couple of other different things and getting to meet just these people I, otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to run into and yeah. um I, i'm looking forward to, to that event again i'll probably only go one day maybe two but um do stuff like that guys you know anybody who's 
again, kind of newer watching, get out to shows, meet people, make connections. You know, the, the humans are a, uh, really are a fantastic part of this hobby. And, 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 you know, this, this community, once you can get into it, you know, you don't, you don't want to get out. Yeah. That, that weekend was such a special time. I mean, I don't think we could ever put together the, the kind of royalty of herpticulture that came together <clears throat> on that weekend. It was, it, that was, that, that event was one of one truly. I feel like it's almost like, like ICAS was, it wasn't that only one or did they do two ICASs? I think they did two. That was East coast. I didn't make it. I couldn't make it. I should have gone. I probably like heard all about it. And, uh, I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I don't know what else I would do with my life if I wasn't doing this snake thing. I don't want to think about that. Uh, you know, like how would I do? What am I just watch TV all the time? Like what would I do? <laughs> I don't know what I would do, but, uh, Oh, I'm excited. I got a new, I, I, I can't say this, uh, Amazon tree bones. I'm yes. going to produce some of those again this year. All right. Talk now to maybe the, Maybe they're slugs. I don't know. We'll see. But like that is the most pregnant bitch in this house for sure. Like okay. I can confidently say that there's a litter coming. But this is the first. This is a different sire. I, I've produced them a couple years in a row or a couple of years now. But this is the first time that um, I, I bred my red. So I have a calico that mm, I bred okay. to a yellow tiger. So I have absolutely no idea what's going to come out. I know there won't be any calicos because apparently it's recessive. So uh, I, I don't expect to get calicos at it, but it should be a really good variety of, of cool tree bows in there. Yeah. That, what, uh, uh, what's the group you're working with right now? How, how many Amazons do you have? Uh, so I have two orange tigers, two yellow tigers, and a calico. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So decent little group. And then I will hold back um, a pair from this next breeding because they will be het calicos and I want to make some calico tigers. Yes. So I'm taking the long road instead of just buying one and kind of starting from scratch. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that that's part of the fun. So it, it, it's OK. Amazons are I feel like that's a species that's really on the on the come up these days. I, I, you know, I think the the way that they've gained popularity in the last like three or four years is uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to find a snake that has gained that kind of popularity in that time frame. Well, the, the Jeremy and his freaking big giant white splotches all over his reds have had a lot to do with that for sure. Absolutely. The, uh, the Calico project has really pushed it forward, but also it turns out they're not nearly as snappy as everybody thought they were guys. Mine are nice. Mine are cool. I feel like there's a theme tonight. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not all mean. They're fine. I have a bunch of sweethearts. I don't need a hook to go into any of my Amazon tree bow enclosures and pull them off a branch. I can just reach in and grab them. They don't care. So, you know, that it, it, it is what it is. They, oh, Lisa said I might. Well, we'll see. They um, seem to be significantly easier to breed than emerald tree bow. Is correct. Uh, I literally, dude, I just put two in a cage and I separated them to feed them and put it back in a cage. The first year I did it, I paid very little attention to any of it and just came in the room one day and there were baby snakes crawling around. And that was the first time I ever bred any kind of boas. And I decided that that was cool and that eggs are less cool than not having eggs. <laughs> there's, there's definitely pros and cons because uh with with uh, gratitude with with a live bear sometimes it might be a giant backed up shit instead of babies and that's a problem oh man don't do that to me <laughs> you saying i'm gonna have a giant backed up shit no but i mean it's like fantastic. last year last year uh I, I i had a litter of hunter and palm vipers and uh from Neat. from when from like ovulation or what was roughly around to when she had her babies uh, it was like 11 months okay i that takes rather, forever i would rather eggs <laughs> okay yeah that's that's too long so question how many i didn't know you did that how many species of venomous have you bred now um i've bred 
three species of venomous. So last year was my first year producing anything. I had two litters of banded rock rattlesnakes, uh, a small litter that ended up with weak babies that didn't make it of Durango rock rattlesnakes, and then a really healthy big litter of uh, Honduran palm vipers. That's cool. What's up with the palm vipers? How hot are those? You don't want to get hit by them. Um, you don't want to get hit by anything, but sure. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're significant. I mean, they're, they're not too far uh, unrelated from, from the Bothrops, uh, the lance heads in, in central and South America. Um, oh yeah. That'll, that'll end your day then. Yeah. They're, but they're, they're a lot smaller. They're not quite as potent and they have a, a lower yield. Um, so, but as, as is with anything, you know, you don't want to fuck around. Um, but I mean, to me, they're the, the, the Bothriacus genus, the, the palm vipers, they're like, they're like the Amazon basins of, of the, the venomous world to me. They're just, okay. I mean, they're, they're just, they're these majestic, beautiful colored arboreal snakes that display super well. And just, they're very poised and they're just, I, I absolutely love those snakes. They're, they're fascinating. Do they allow venomous at the Texas shows? All yes, from mo most of them, um, there are certain counties and whatnot that that don't allow venomous. So some of those shows are a no go. Like the Dallas, like the NARBCs never did, but I, I think that was like an NARBC rule. But now in in Dallas, because it's, it's in the city proper of Dallas, I mean most things aren't allowed there at, at this show, and certainly not venomous. Um, so oh, yeah, what's up with that? No, like. The real yeah. what was it like it was like, like what's the deal what's the real with what's going on with that to my understanding it's uh it's mostly a bow and python thing so there's no pythons other than ball pythons allowed no boas other than boa imperator allowed see why are they even having a show that is I so don't weird know. that's a good question for the i mean i guess you know that that maybe eliminates 10 percent of of uh what people bring, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be a little more lame than Arlington, but yeah, something tells me this will be the last year they do a show in Dallas. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, but, uh, yeah, it seemed like a strange decision, but I also, I'm, I'm not part of making that decision. So yeah, who knows? There, there's like a weird workaround of like, if you're not from the area, you can, display the animal but you can't sell them something like that okay that's so, gonna work out <laughs> yeah right <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it's gonna drive away most breeders who who do off the wall pythons and boas which is unfortunate because at arlington you know like michael pinnell always brought some some really cool stuff you know all of like the his different carpets and like, interesia and stuff like that so uh you know People like that. That's a Morelia legend, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, even like the VPI booth, they would they would bring uh, you know lots of blood python morphs and stuff like that. Nope. So. Are the Barkers? Do they live in Texas? Mm-hmm. Uh, do yep. you know them? No, I, I don't know them. I, I met Dave at uh, at Arlington in 2019, but I. I, I can't imagine he remembers me. I was just, I was there with Forrest and I probably didn't say a word the whole time. So <laughs> it wasn't too memorable. <laughs> I, I would love to have an opportunity to meet those two. That would mean a lot to me. Yeah. It really would. Yeah. You know, again, you know, our, the hobby, it's, it's got its legends, you know, and it doesn't really get any more legendary than, than VPI I mean, and mean, the Barkers. To, to bring it back to scrub pythons, I, they may, I don't know if they were the first people to breed scrubs in the U.S., but they had to be some of the first, you know. And, and two the, by two by two melamine enclosures, man. That, uh, from, from what I hear, there's a very small pair of southerns that produced. Hell yeah. And nuts. Yeah. <laughs> nuts. And, you know, I'm, I'm super fortunate. I have three animals, three barn eggs in my collection that are, that you can trace back to, to early VPI productions from like 2000, 2002. So very cool. It's uh, yeah. I, I always like the, when you can implement some of that history into it, it just makes those animals that much more special when it's like, you know, this, this animal is what it is, but here are four steps back. Why it is, you know, why it looks like this. Yeah.
Well, like when I bought my uh, my Waminas from Ryan Young, I, I did that specifically because I hadn't ever bought snakes from Ryan Young. Mm. You know, oh, what's up, Rob? Hey, Rob and uh, you know, I'm what's like, I've known this guy for so long, I've never bought snakes from him before. You know, I gotta, you know, and I'll I'll have some some cush heat in here at some point. I'll get I'll, I'll I'll get something from you, and you know that's what I, I, still, like I do. I do still owe you one. From my friends, I still owe you one from a couple of years ago. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot that. Thank you. <laughs> this was this was through behind like thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! But anyway, uh, what about rough scale pythons, dude? Do you like those? I do like rough scale pythons. Um, it's another one of like. I don't know if I, I did. I used to keep one rough scale python. I really, I really like that animal. Um, you know, I uh, I got to see one of the first ones that was brought in. Oh, it was probably like 2017. It was an adult male um, at an event that that the Wildlife Discovery Center used to run, and uh, that animal was just. It was amazing. Just you know, snakes don't feel like that. You know. Uh-huh. That's do do you keep rough scales? I have a pair, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh who, who uh, produced your pair? Uh so Nick produced my female, Casey Lazic produced my male. Okay. Hell so, yeah. Yeah. And again, I bought that snake from Casey specifically because I had never bought a snake from Casey before. You know, and yeah. I, I needed a, a Casey animal, you know. And, uh, I mean, Lazic, shoot, there you go. You know, another legend and, yeah. you know, it, it's, I, I think it's, it's important to support the right people, you know, in, in, in this hobby. And yeah, dude, my rough scales, I fell in love with them the first time in Matt Minotola's basement. Okay. Uh, it was a, uh, carpet fest. And before carpet fest, I got invited to go over to Matt's house and check out his basement, which is absolutely insane. That guy's, uh, blood and Borneo collections just out of this world. Yeah, uh, really you know, sad. I, yeah, that was kind of where I got my introduction to, uh, you know, short tail pythons, frankly, because yeah. I hadn't really ever hung out with anybody who loved them. I'd only hung out with babies, never, you know, big old giant fat freaking beasts dude they're they're, they're yeah. cool and uh he had a pair of rough scale pythons and i'd never seen one in person before and you know i pulled it out and one bit me right in the finger and wrapped me and then thought i was thought i was food and i thought it was adorable and from there on out i had to have a pair of rough scale pythons so that's how Hell i fell yeah. in love with rough scale pythons that's, uh, that's a pretty good reason Dude, I remember some of the there's like one old uh, NPR episode that that Matt did where he was like breaking down Borneo genetics. My head has never hurt more from a reptile podcast in my life. I think I listened like two or three times and I was still like, I don't know. I don't fucking get it. I don't understand, I don't understand it. it. <laughs> I don't like, understand it at all. Read that to that, but you get all of those. And if you read the marbles, you may not get marbles, but you might if you don't. What? <laughs> like my brain uh, hurts i don't get it they're not my speed pretty much everything i keep here lives on a branch you know that's that's except i have a pair of ball pythons well i should say my son has a pair of ball pythons here mm. from uh good from MJ. They're my uh, son. But, but everything else yeah exactly they're his snakes they're not my snakes that doesn't count um he takes care of them he's doing great with them. um oh, yeah. But other than that, I, I do try to stay in my lane with the arboreal and the semi-arboreal stuff. I, I you know, yeah. I I, I want to be able to drape it around my neck. I want it to hold me. I want to feel its grip. You know what I mean? And I and I want it to at least look like it's going to have an attitude problem. It doesn't have to have one, but I want it to look like it's going to have one. You just want and, to. Uh, yeah, and the the big blood pythons. I'm like, I I don't know what to do with you. You know. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're they're definitely not quite my speed either, but I really I admire a lot of the different, you know, morph combos that have been made and just I mean even some of like the really like high red blood python wild types. They're they're just they're beautiful snakes. They're just again for me just a little bit too much of a deviation from what's kind of my typical. You know, it's got me going lately though too that I'll probably never own same reason, but uh Sri Lankan pythons. Whew. 
Those things are freaking sick. I'd love some pure Indians though. Dude, when, um, I, when I was at the Wildlife Discovery Center, there were 1.2 uh, pure Indian pythons that were from San Diego Zoo, and I was I was 13 years old, and I got to interact with true pure Indian pythons, and that I mean those animals were just out of this world. They were so incredible. I, I, I yeah, I'm, if if I had the opportunity to to get pure Indian pythons, I I definitely would. They're those animals are just they're so special. Would you ever keep Afrox? I did keep Afrox before, and I, I like them, um, but I don't think I would again. They just they get too big, and and if I you know for me if I have a big cage, I need I want a big scrub in it. So I'm, I'm glad I did get to keep African rocks. I, I I've always been fascinated by by those snakes, and uh, you know they were they were fun to work with when when I when I had them. I'm not a fan of the pattern list. It kind of kills it for me. Yeah. Yeah. Me either. I, I, when I saw them, I was like, Oh wow, that's neat. They quick because it's different. But for me, it's almost kind of like, it's not quite the same, but like is Anthic Malukans, like the, yet yeah, the normals are better looking, but it's cool to also have the Azanthics, but the normals mm -hmm. are better looking. Uh, I think the normal rock pythons are a lot better looking than the pattern list rock pythons, but still it is, it is cool. So how do you think the market's going to be for Malukans if if uh, more 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 come around? I mean, this last batch we know those were freaking expensive. Um, yeah. Do you think that mark will be like? Do you think you think we're going to be able to sell them for that again? Are you referring to the recent wild cots that came in, or the past captive breads that were available? No, the captive breads. Wild caught doesn't count. Oh, uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope no one decides to price them that high because I, I, you know, my, my take on the Malukans has always been that my biggest fear is that they become the next Bolins or they're the next trophy snake that everyone wants one of to post on their TikTok. And the yeah. reason, the main reason why Bolins went that way was because nerd got them, made them the TikTok snake and then posted wild caught babies for 10 grand a piece. And because they're, their fan base and their followers didn't know any better. That became the new price point. And now no one ever buys pairs of Bolin's pythons again. They buy one because they can't afford a pair. And who's uh, gonna be the guy who's gonna be the guy to chop that price in half though if they actually produce a clutch? I will say though, I I, I give credit to to Scott Flood for uh at Tinley Park, the his Bolins were were 10 grand a piece for captive bread. To price them the same as the overpriced Wildcots. I respect it a lot because he could have easily said 15,000 a piece and definitely wouldn't have ever gotten that amount of money, but could be justified on the basis of the wild cots are 10,000. I think wild caught should be a third of that at most. That's just me. Any because, idea what they're coming in at fresh from an importer? Uh, no. Ah, oh, come on. Spill the tea. No, <laughs> I'll tell you later. Um, <laughs> to the point where they should be, they could easily be priced at what they were in 2016. Now it's just greed. That's the only reason why they're so expensive. That's not because they need to make their money. It's because they can make their money. Um, so with, with that said though, um, I don't want Malukins to go that way. So I think some sort of happy medium has to be hit with them. They're going to be the most valuable scrub python going forward, bar none. Uh, I mean, they're yeah. they're they are everything. Look at them. I think they're as special as Bolin's pythons. I, I think they are up there with Bolin's pythons. Um, I, I but I I think the same about of the highest end orange highlands, the highest end arus, the highest end barnix. I, I think that these animals are that special. Um, but from purely supply and demand mm -hmm. standpoint, Malukans are going to be the most expensive scrub python, and that just is what it is. Um, but the market is not there to where an individual scrub python can sell for five thousand dollars, for seven seventy five hundred dollars. Like that's just not we're not there, and we may never be, but we're certainly. Oh, not you just wait till like episode fifty at Kush's Corner, dog. You'll get it there. <laughs> the but, show's um, gonna pop that way up. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm all for scrub pythons having value, but I'm I'm not for them being a trophy animal. Um, you know, 
the the price needs to be to the point where if you are spending this amount of money on an animal, you know what you're getting into. You're going to have a good enclosure. You're going to do your research. You're going to ask the right questions, but not so expensive where it's it's only available to the the top two to three percent of the market as far as what someone can drop on on a table and and you know walk away with a snake um, because that's not sustainable in the long run. With the amount of people who are breeding scrubs now and the amount of clutches that are being produced every year, we're like one or two years away from never needing a wild caught again. In my opinion. Perfect. That's I, and, great. And, and, and it'll be great that wild caught, as long as they keep coming in, can establish new bloodlines. There's definitely new types of scrub pythons that exist that, you know, we'd love to have and kept. Like for me, like I have one Key Island scrub. I, I need a female Key Island scrub. If, if, if importation shut out tomorrow, I'd be screwed um but from like barnex southerns you know the, the ones that we have numbers of i think in a year or two we'll never need another import like if importation cut off i think we do that um and that that to me is is the long-term goal obviously as it should be with anything um but in order for that to happen the people that are buying these animals need to have at least some amount of ambition to be that next generation or at least keep those animals until they place them with somebody else with that ambition. You know, um, I, I just, I think we're at a point where that's, that's like the focus I think of the the next few years of scrub pythons is getting into the point where like people like them, people are into them, people want to keep them, but people are looking two, three generations down the line of, you know, these animals, these captive bred animals are so special. They can't go to waste, you know? Well, and, and dude, that's why I'm so excited that you're doing this pod is I think when it comes with scrubs, building the community is really what we need to be focusing on right now, mm. you know, because the you we have to build a community of scrub python keepers. There's already a community of, you know, this and that and the other, and, you know, the group of scrub guys that are really mean it are it's so small and, and and we need to branch that out we need to invite other other people and to enjoy just these these phenomenal snakes and and you know I, I guess popularity you know that's another word to look at it but it just it, it needs to be a species people want in their collections and the snakes when you give them a chance they do that themselves you know but it's up to us to introduce them to people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why when MJ approached me with the idea of doing this podcast, I, I was like, hell yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's another reason why, you know, uh, Andrew Acevedo and I started the new Somalia group on Facebook. Um, you know, there, there are scrub Python groups out there, but uh, unfortunately some of those have ties to the old guard of gatekeeping and bullying and talking down to people and, you know, not being open to new keepers. Um, and I, I think that everyone who I've, I've had conversations with who are in, you know, in, in this kind of current group of, of scrub python breeders all have the same mentality. Um, they, they were all burned by some of those, those old heads, quote unquote, who were, who were real nasty to deal with um, and, and don't want to have to put the next group of people who are interested in these snakes through that you know, saw the down, the downside of, of gatekeeping what you're interested in. <coughs> well, you, you can feel all high and mighty and like you're the only one, but you know, once you have a few clutches on the ground and you want to sell these animals, people don't want to buy them from you because you've been an asshole to them. You know, exactly. Yeah. Facts. Facts. And we just need people this to want to buy it. Right here. Who's, who's, who's doing it the right yeah. way. Yeah. Oh, Rob, man. Man, congratulations to that guy. There's somebody that's been doing some great work with some scrubs. Much respect to you, sir. Mm -hmm. Rob's the man. Everybody Rob's on here, man. keep an eye out. This is a foreshadowing moment of the episode. I guess that's all I'll say. Oh, really? We got is that okay? Cool. <laughs> looking, look, looking forward to that guy. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, you know, his, his animals are absolutely beautiful. I wish I knew where my male barnack was from. 12 gauge looks real product. He really mm. does. 
but I can't say he's Prada. I'm not saying he's Prada. Sure. I'm just saying that he has these looks to him that kind of make me think that. And it's possible. The story that I was told, the story, right, is I bought him from Triple L Reptile as okay. an adult. And the, you know, he had a not for sale sign on him. And I was talking to the, the general manager and he said that it was somebody from the San Diego zoo. That's a lizard keeper that just had him as a pet that had bought him as a captive bred baby and raised him up to an adult and then uh, was downsizing or doing whatever and just sold him to, to triple L. So triple L got it from a guy who works at a zoo who got it as a baby when it was captive bred. Now the snake's at least mm -hmm. 10 years old. Snake's got to be about 10 years old. And I'm just guessing, but it was a full grown adult male when I got him. And he's, that was, you know, four or five years ago. It was the same freaking size. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, but like when I look <laughs> I at some of the, there's one of three places it could be from if it's truly captive bred, and it would be Prada, Means, or Yasser. I think that's that's well, it. You know right? how the Prada stuff has kind of that darker head mm -hmm. and like a little, yeah. He's I mean, got my, my, my Prada girl has the fucking coolest head of any scrub that I keep. She has that like it's almost like the ink like bled through the lines, and it's so yeah. cool. My male's got the same thing. That's why I'm like, oh man, I wish I knew, you know, but I, 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 yeah, I honestly I'm, don't. Yeah. But I'm, I'm glad that some of that bloodline is still around. I'm, uh, Rob, if you're still there, I'm, I'm almost certain that Janet's Prada line, uh, comment the answer. For sure. Yeah. I, I know. Um, I, I know. I know she is. Yeah. He's talked about it a lot. She is. And, uh, you know, I have one Prada line girl and there, you know, there's, there's animals that are, they're still out there and, you know, to me, it's the same like having the old VPI lineage in my collection. Like, I'd love to be able to merge the two worlds one day. Um, you know, like what you know, what what are our F three barnacks going to look like in in however long until F threes are possible? Like that, you know, that's that's what that's what excites me. Like, the stuff that's being produced now is incredible. What about their babies? That's where because if if these F one animals are as nice as they've been. What, what about F3 and F4? Like, <laughs> you know, we're going to see some, some especially with Barnix, like some scrubs that we probably couldn't even imagine right now. There's something about taking the best from the clutch and then taking the best from the clutch and taking the best from the clutch. You know, it, it just ask Ed Moreno, right? You can do some insane stuff when you... Yeah when you keep at it for a long period of time. And yes, yeah, scrubs are no different. I think the future is very bright for scrub pythons. I think we've just got, you know, the, the, the world will open up to them for sure. Uh, you know, the yeah, hobby's yeah. going to open up to them more than yeah. it has. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I, I'd really like that I've, that I've seen is that, uh, you know, one issue that, that green tree pythons always had was you'd be at a, at an expo and, you know, you've just produced two clutches of green tree pythons. You have 12 babies on the table for, you know, for however, however much, you know, a thousand bucks a piece, whatever. And then importer flipper guy over there has them for 250. And the, the customer asks you questions for an hour and set up yada yada. Okay, I'll think about it. And you see him walking out of the show with the one off the flipper table. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in scrub pythons. Um, there's some animals that have been on morph market, some some wild caughts that have been up there for a long time. And they're not expensive. And people aren't biting on them. People are biting on cat red animals for quite a bit more than those wild caughts. And yeah. they're reaping the rewards um, because they're just, they're getting an entirely different animal. And I, I, I like that that's happening already because I mean, you know, we, we both have captive bred scrubs, like speaking from experience, it's, it's a totally different beast. Um, and from a new keeper standpoint, you know, that, that, that person who bought that green tree Python could have a terrible experience, yada, 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 never keep green trees again. If they had bought that captive bred animal, give it five years and, uh, and they could have 15 green tree pythons and, and had, you know, had two clutches and, 
it, that that first animal can really make or break it, uh, in in my opinion. Um, For sure, hundred percent. You see, K Katie says uh, there was an exantic clastophus in England that sat on Morph Market for six plus months. At, uh, what's uh, two hundred euro? What's that like three hundred? I think it's no, it's like one hundred eighty U.S. or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Maybe, maybe my conversion, but yeah, I, I went, Hi, Katie. Katie, I wonder when that was, but, but yeah, I've heard that the, the, the European market is, is entirely different, which is surprising to me because they've been cut off on imports for, for a good bit of time now, um, you know, for a few years. So there, there's not, not there's wild cots all over Europe. You know, if, if you, have, if there's a scrub python in Europe, it's a captive bread. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, I, I believe so. And, you know, Katie might have information that I don't. But uh, I want to say it was like 2020 when when uh, when Europe stopped getting Indo imports. I think that's when like a lot of people or like maybe 2019, like people here in the States. Oh. Last year, maybe that was for the class of lepers. But, but anyway, because um, I remember talking to. Uh, to Casper about it uh, when he was like talking about stuff with like his Bolins pythons, um, that that was going to be a big issue for Bolins in, in in Europe, and he was afraid that you know give it a few years or whatnot, and, and then Bolins will be t entirely lost in in Europe. Um, and that that's when I I bought my first Halmaheras was after that conversation with him. Uh, was like shit, I don't have Halmaheras, I I need Halma, and that was before they'd been produced too, or I think like months before uh oklahoma city zoo hatched out the clutch um and i'm like damn that would be uh that would be pretty tragic if 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 all of a sudden just on a uh, you know at the drop of a dime uh these these snakes that you know i had plans to keep in the future just were no longer available to me so, yeah, no. dude it could happen at any time man yeah, it could no happen to it would. at any time and I mean, I won't be surprised if it happens in our, you know, in our lifetime, unfortunately. And, you know, just doing the best that we can with, with what we have and, and keeping lines, you know, and, and, you know, we have a job to do here in order to make sure that our grandchildren are able to experience and enjoy and love these snakes. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it's up to us. And, and, I, and I do think that we, we take for granted a lot of the unpopular stuff, the cheap stuff, you know. And it's, cheap um, until it's not, you know, that, that's the thing. Like it's cheap until, yeah. until people decide it's no longer cheap. And then and then it's either like, thank God somebody liked these or, oh, fuck, now they're gone. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. there, there's two there's two options there. And uh, the first one is is the preferred one for me, you know, where, where the knight in shining armor comes in and is like, I've been breeding black throated monitors this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where are my savannah breeders at, dude? <laughs> but yeah, like black throat monitors were, were a huge example of that, where like for a while they were like 350, 300 bucks. You could see them at most reptile shows as fresh imports, completely got cut off. And then they were like twenty five hundred a piece for fake captive bred animals that were smuggled. Like, damn, I missed that. That I missed that. It was like 2016, 2015, probably. Um, but to me, like that was just one example of uh, you know, I mean, black throat monitors are are one of the most incredible monitor species, and they were so readily available that no one took the time to actually work with them, and. Uh, felt the felt the consequences when i mean think about how many thousands probably were imported over time to how many existed once once the once they were cut off you know no man for sure and i mean that's the story of uh you know monitors in general thank god i'm so glad uncle mike's doing a pod it's so cool <laughs> gets me all excited you know that's what it. i mean and and uh you know, just just seeing the, the the different passion for the monitors. Monitor breeding has come a long way. You know, I, I don't own monitors anymore, but I used to, and I'd like to again, and, and one day I will. Um, yeah. 
you know, and I, I miss my Nile monitor, man. My Nile monitor, I, I love that animal, dude. She was dope. I got her as a little baby. Um, I was like 18, you know, and uh, and had her in a big ass dope enclosure. I had a pond in there too that I I didn't hook it up to plumbing, but I was able to drain it into my backyard. I drilled a hole through the side of my house and freaking <laughs> just sent a, sent a, a drain pipe out the side of it and just oh, yeah. had it run to the back. Good old, you know, <laughs> and uh, and it was cool, man. And unfortunately, at the time, I didn't know that they needed a place to lay. And, you know, she was a female and she became sexually mature and she didn't have a good lay box or a good environment to dig, you know, mm -hmm. and she ended up uh, uh, egg bound. And, you know, I think she died from from being egg bound. She was probably six or seven years old. And that was super yeah. sad. But how much fun I had with that lizard raising her up, though, you know, and, uh, and she was she's freaking mean dude the not niles don't play <laughs> no they don't no they don't it's like you're ready for war whenever you you know you had to really prepare yourself when uh when you were going in that enclosure to put some work in yeah monitors are different you know when when you take a bite from a monitor you don't really look at any snakes the same way anymore you're like that's child's play <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> are you keeping any monitors right now no, I personally don't have any monitors. Um, I, I'd like to again at some point, but I mean, you know, going from being involved in the collection with 40, 50 monitors to, to now zero, I think like two, maybe four. And that's like, I think my, my dream scenario is a, a pair of blue phase uh, lace monitors and a pair of captive bread croc monitors. And I think that's it. Uh, okay. Okay, so you're going for the species. I mean, you, you can't really consider Komodos in that conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, of, of available monitors, laces and crocs, 100%. See, I would probably go either the tree monitor out because those are fun, or, you know, just a, just a plain old Asian water monitor, man. Yeah. Just just give me a standard, no, no morph, just nice Asian water monitor to raise up to be my dog. Yeah. And uh, that'd be fantastic. I, I'd love it. One day, there's a lot of time left. I think to, 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 to make a little callback, I think Blackthroat monitors might be like a third on that list. I really – Okay. I mean, when I was at the Wildlife Discovery Center, we had a an, an old male. He was probably 25 years old. He was like – six and a half foot and no less than 50 pounds he was a fucking monster he had a huge head just a puppy dog that was he was an incredible animal um so yeah i mean that i think that might be my one two three lace croc black throat growing up um i had a really good friend still my friend travis johnson uh living legless reptiles yep and uh we worked at the same reptile shop together and travis had a full-grown adult black throat that it's uh, you know we didn't freaking know any better man but uh, we, we it lived in a six by three is full-grown black throat yeah it had a six by three vision cage right with its heat light on it and but its door was always open and it just free roamed the apartment <laughs> <laughs> and it had a it had a big old water thing in there and it had its basking spot you know and uh and otherwise that thing just dude it it got stuck so many places <laughs> and like cabinets got ripped out and refrigerators had to move and everything got knocked off i do cords everywhere i mean it just it, it absolutely destroyed the place, but uh, you know, that's what we did when we were kids. I, I have a really hard time judging people now. Like, I can't, you know, like, yeah. uh, mistakes. Mistakes have been made, um, but uh, you know, that was such a cool lizard because I remember sitting on his couch and that thing would walk up and crawl up your legs and sit on your lap and just and just hang out with you like a freaking cat yeah. you know yeah, like yeah. and uh anyway cool 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 species man the, the the whole that's why i keep so much stuff now i just i like all the different things 
you know yeah I, I don't have too much of anything right now i think i have 18 species that live here you know and nice. uh when when i get a new house eventually i'm sure i'll have more <laughs> same <laughs> same yeah but that's that's what makes this special man that's what makes it fun just never never being con content with what you're doing you know always always staying curious you know always keeping the mind open to to new possibilities and whatnot i, I do want to say you'll be more successful if you do what you're doing and hone in on a specific species and work sure. it. And yeah work it and work it and work it if you want success in the hobby do that yeah i'm more of a noah's art guy i've got a pair of everything <laughs> you know yeah. except jungle carpets i've got like i've got a lot of jungle carpets but you know yeah. you gotta have something really a house dude you gotta have jungles every year <laughs> yeah. yes sir yeah no i mean that's I think that is generally true, but I, I'm I'm at like I think 32 or 33 species. Um, so you know, not not a ton, uh, but not five. You know? Most of those are venomous, though, right? Uh, they're like about half, because I have some okay. colubrids as well, um, and then a couple other pythons that are not scrubs, but uh, it's only almost entirely scrubs on the python front. Okay. Yeah, I think, okay. I think it's like 18 species of venomous snakes. So, but they all kind of fall into the same umbrella of, you know, high elevation, cooler temperatures cycle the same way. So they're, they're all just different variations on the same kind of general framework of what that kind of snake is. Sure. No, I, I get it. Dude, I've never, hold on. Let me think. I've never owned a colubrid. Can you say that again for the people in the back? I've never owned a colubrid. Never. Never. Why? I don't know. Uh, That's a problem. Well, I if, that. if I was going to do it, I would have to do mm, probably Kribos. I would be interested in Kribos. Not I would be interested in Indigos. Hit Brooke up, man, uh, for the hmm? Rubidus. You got to hit up Brooke for the Rubidus. Oh wow, she got some. Oh yeah, she does. I saw. Wait, I saw. It. In the country. Okay. Now, do you, I need to put heat on those at all, or can I just keep them ambient? Especially if, if your room is, you know, upper seventies, straight ambient. Okay, that's easy. Don't I have to feed them a lot though? It depends what you feed them. Um, you know, I mean, once, maybe twice a week during like the heavy season when they're younger, probably a little more frequently. Uh, I used to keep Rubidus too. And uh, I, I did mostly a rodent diet where, where she varies it a lot, a lot more than I did. But uh, if you're feeding leaner items, you got to feed more frequently. If you're feeding rodents, you feed less frequently, you know, but I mean, they're not going to be your, your pythons and, and boas, but they're definitely going to, you know, they're not, as they're not the the monster people make them out to be, I, I don't. I think it's totally blown out of proportion what people say about dry marcon. Yeah, I think they're cool. I always stop by and 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 you know every time I, I every time I go to a show, I always sit and stare at them for a second because there's there's something about that like solid black with like that red. You know what I mean? That that it's just. It, it it's just cool. Uh, I I like those a lot. There there will be a day. I'll 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 get to the colubrids. I have some goals to accomplish with pythons first. Yeah. Well, if you're you're gifting me this gelatin, you might be uh might be gifted some beauty snakes or some Mexican pines this year or something like that. Oh, <laughs> dude, the beauty snakes are cool. I like the beauty snakes. The blue beauties, right? Yeah, those are the ones that yeah. I breed. And then I uh this year hopefully to have uh Cameron Highland cave racers, which are arguably the most colorful snakes in the entire world um no -uh, really all right yeah, Cam Cameron, I, know, I have no idea what those are locality let's see if i can do some quick technology uh i'm we're, we're we're two plus hours deep if you're still rolling with us you can take some dead air for for a minute um this is going to be shitty tub picture we're going to throw up on the screen but it, it shows their coloration very very well 
Um, right. But yeah, they're they're so they're in the beauty snake family, the the uh, cave dwelling rat snakes or cave racers. It's the uh, Ridley eye is the species name. So they're they're subspecies with the Vietnamese blue beauties, the Chinese beauties, the Taiwanese beauties, the uh, Gabrowski's rat snakes, yada yada yada. So uh, like six, seven feet. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Not not as big as the blue beauties. Um, and now to do the upload of the picture. Dun 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 dun. dun. Okay, here we go. So, shitty breeding tub pick incoming, but that's what they look like. Oh, that is neat. And that's yeah. like a wild type? Mm hmm. Yep. Wow. They're like See, five they're... snakes crammed into one snake. Yeah. Why? Where in the wild does that color make sense for survival? Do you ever ask yourself that question? <laughs> I mean, so I mean, you know, as the namesake states, they're you know they're a partially cave dwelling species, often kind of sitting near the the mouths of uh, of caves, hunting bats and and whatnot. Um, there's a different form of cave dwelling rat snake, which are, are a lot less vibrant than these, which I have as well. Which like you look at those snakes, it's like take that coloration and like lower the vibrancy, uh, and you're like, oh, that snake lives in a cave. Um, but this particular locality just happens to be super vibrant like this, you know, powder blue, neon yellow, red, orange, like it, it's purple. Like, I mean, they're, they are insane. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's cool. So that's very cool. Got the, the, like the mascara mark on the eyes. They're, they're badass. Um, you know, the, they're, they're sick. The tiger rat snake, tiger rat snakes from to me, the Spilotes genus, that's the that's the top of the the mountain on on uh colubrids. Um they're just what are the ones Dan like single handedly made popular as fuck? Um the, the highest Coronado. Yeah, that oh you got one? This hello Helen. Don't don't you do it. So this is actually funny that you say that. This right here, this is Helen Keller. She is totally blind. She is a Pataius Coronata, giant keeled rat snake. Nice. This is the female that Dan bred. Awesome. So I'm fairly certain the first ever captive reproduction of Pataius Coronata. She's very old. She's double cataract. Can't see at all. And actually, this was really cool because I've never seen a snake adjust to blindness. When I got her, she had one cataract and developed the second one in my care. Uh huh. And, and it was it was so cool to see the adaptability of of these animals. Like the first few times I fed her, it was a nightmare. And now she eats like a snake with vision because these are you know these guys are sight hunters. Um, and uh, now she's relying entirely on smell which is not what they're typically doing um, or, you know, primarily. So it was very, and, cool to see. and she's a sweetheart too. She's just, she's the best. Yeah. She seems super chill. Very so, cool, man. That's yeah. dope that you have that. I remember yeah. I, cause I had never heard of it before until I, you know, until Dan. And then yeah. all of a sudden I'm like, dude, that is fucking awesome. Like, what is the, the, the females are significantly smaller than the males. The males are the ones that are like 11 feet long and fucking beefy. Um, I used to have a male. Okay, so super sexually dimorphic then? Size-wise, yeah. And then uh, the people who are breeding them say that you don't want those males, that they, they aren't good at lining up the proportions uh, with the female, and they get frustrated and they'll eat them. <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I, I feel like uh, you got that a lot. Cannibalistic. With colubrids. Say that again. I feel like you get that a lot with colubrids. The whole cannibalism thing. With with some, and uh, I'm gonna since we're at this part of the show. This is for both Lisa and Katie, who I see are talking about these in the comments. This is the paler form of the cave dwelling rat snake, the Ridley eye. 
Mm. So you see how it has the, the same pattern as the one that I showed in the picture, but just like you take the vibrancy and you just turn it down like 50 points. Yeah. I love these two. Uh, I have a pair as well. My, my female is just a lot younger. Um, I've had this male for probably eight going on nine years. So, so are they different subspecies or is that a morph thing? Uh, their locality difference. Okay. Yep. So this, I mean, this is full grown, you know, he's probably almost seven feet, but, but really, really slender. So I'm yeah, being I, I, by my father. God. <laughs> no, doubt. I will not. That's awesome. Where do you think I learned it from? So, yeah, no, I mean, I, I like that we got on this topic because to, to me, the, the experience of herpticulture is incomplete without colubras. Um, they're just, uh, you know, obviously the scrub pythons are my favorite, followed secondarily by the montane rattlesnakes and vipers. But uh, to me, it just, they're just, they're, they're so different because, you know, with us, with pythons and boas, we're used to animals that are working off of, of heat sensory for the most part, you know, where these guys are primarily site oriented. Um, I feel like scrub pythons definitely bridge that gap um, where uh -huh. they use their eyes a lot more than probably any other python or boa. Um, so there's, oh, there's that. It's part of why I like them so much. Um, but just working with, you know, with colubrids that are they're, they're working on different senses entirely. Uh, I, I just, I think it's a really cool, very, you know, variety in, in the experience. Now uh, I used to help clean cages for a, for a woman who had uh, some indigos and she fed hers frog legs. Is mm -hmm. that a thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, think about what an indigo snake is. It's, it's basically like a foraging snake. They're always on the move and they're just kind of eating what they can. They're high metabolism. They'll eat, they'll eat rodents. They'll eat, I mean, birds would be, I don't know how they would get their hands on birds because they're not often that arboreal, but they would, if they could, they'll raid a nest, they'll eat eggs, they'll eat snakes, they'll eat lizards, amphibians. They just eat what they can. Um, so, you know, I, I, frog legs for sure, lizard parts for sure you know snakes that didn't make it i mean there's people who uh keep dry marcon for the sake of feeding stillborn snakes they just don't want them to go to waste so they buy a crebo or an indigo and that's where their stillborns go i mean yeah that's why not you know yeah no for sure yeah and you know no man i'm, I'm here for it i'll i'll, I'll get a pair but here, I, I guess we'll 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 round out our experience unless these guys are breeding, which they are not. So I will pick this male up. Holy sh wow! This is my my male blue beauty. Yeah, that's a beast. So these guys, they're big snakes. He's he's about nine feet long, uh, but as you can see, super slender, um, and very very calm demeanor. I've had people debate me online that these snakes are not super chill. Fight me. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man, that's a cool, that's a great, that, that's a beautiful. Now those come in different color forms, right? Yeah. There's some that are on like the green side and the yellow side. The, the lighting is washing it out, but he's, he is very blue. The females even, even deeper blue. Um, but, uh, but yes, they're, they're pretty great. Um, I mean, it's it's gonna be hard to really tell on the the little camera we have, but yeah, that's a big that's a big snake. snake. So that's a yeah, big they're, snake. They're badass. Yeah. All right. That's 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 dope. Yes, I will I will I will, I will accept a, a a blue beauty should you produce another clutch. That would be cool. Yes. Yes, indeed. There. They're together right now, so that's the uh, that's the goal. And then, since I saw a comment, I feel morally obligated for the Mexican pine snakes. Is that, is that what we're doing? 
We're doing Mexican wines. Yeah, those are cool too. Yeah. Yeah. To me, this is like to, uh... the ultimate like pet snake. They're not that big. This is, I mean, this is my breeder female. Uh, and they're just, I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. I mean, and now those have the keeled scales too, right? Minorly, yeah. Very, very minorly, but yeah, they do have keeled scales. So I mean they're you know they're related to bull snakes, you know, northern pine snakes, uh gopher snakes, you know. But there's like a smaller Mexican variety. I get so excited when I catch um gopher snakes out here. Cause we, you know, we get a lot of gopher snakes. You know, yeah. I, I've uh I've caught them just locally in, in my neighborhood before. And um, well, you know, well, they're 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 all over. So that's 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 the local homie. Those are those are the ones you want to let loose in the backyard, you know. Hopefully, in a month or two, gophers start popping up over. Probably, up, honestly, probably like a few weeks until the gopher snakes start coming out around these parts. So yeah, it's about herpid time. Is it's we're we're there. Yeah, we've uh, we've found a couple snakes so far, a couple black tail rattlesnakes so far this year, but uh, definitely need to get out there. Are those what's local to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so local here are black tail rattlesnakes, banded rock rattlesnakes, mottled rock rattlesnakes, uh, western diamondbacks, and prairies. Okay, excellent. Yes. Very cool. So very, very good variety of, of rattlesnakes in the in the area. And then within a few hours of a drive in any which direction, you know, more banded rock rattlesnakes, uh, specks, sidewinders, you know, you name it up north into Utah, like the Great Basins and Midget I didn't know. I didn't know Sidewinders made it out that far. Not out this far, but if, I mean, if you go west from, from here a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah but no, that's like in the immediate, immediate area. I, I want to say I find more Sidewinders out here than anything else. I find more Sidewinders out here than I do gopher snakes. We did it. Uh, you know, it was awesome. You know. Oh, we, we should do it again. Our, our car rolled up on you guys all like, you know, circled around a sidewinder. Yeah. It was pretty badass. Yeah. Let's do it again. Next time you come out, I'd love to do a herp, herp, herp night on uh, one of the shows. Yeah. Million percent. Definitely need to do that. When are you coming out here next? Um, For probably for the, the June show or whatever it is. Um, Pet fair. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully that that's that's hopefully in the works. But uh, but you know Southern California is worth the trip on its own. No no show uh, necessary. So well, whenever you're out here, if you're down, let's go herping. I'm in. Dude, absolutely, I'd love to. I'd absolutely love to. Well, dude, we've been we're almost at the two hour forty minute mark. We've been we've been at this for a while tonight. Um, I mean, I've first of all, thank you for your time, dude. This has been an awesome conversation. I've, I've loved it. Yeah, no, this has been fun. This is cool. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, you're uh, you're definitely you're you're a natural on the podcast. It's not it's not hard to interview you. So this is this has been this has been very easy. So I bounce back and forth a lot, kind of everywhere. Sorry. That's which, <laughs> that's, that's exactly what uh, that's exactly what this is all about. Um, so uh, I guess fi final couple of questions would just be like. You know what are what are some things that are on your on your radar for what you want to add in the future to your collection? I guess we'll start there. What's like what are like a couple of things that are really piquing your interest these days? So with the emerald tree boas for sure. Um, I need to finish that out because out of things that I want to breed, <laughs> that's all that I don't have paired. So okay. specifically, I'm looking for Chris Rice to make a male northern emerald trebo available because i want to buy one from chris and uh i'm hoping that he will be able to hook me up with one soon so uh that'll be the next snake that i buy is going to be a, a northern from chris and then i need a male basin but i don't really need one soon and i can't afford one this year anyway so i'm sure. hoping next year uh i would like mj to produce a litter of them so that I can buy one from MJ because right now the only MJ snakes I have are ball pythons for my kid mm -hmm. and I need, I need something else. So I need the track mm -hmm. to produce me a basin and I need coach rice to hook me up with a Northern. So those are the next two on my hit list. Hell yeah. Well, that's, that's a great answer. Um, what's like one or two of your dream herping trips? 
Oh, uh, well, I keep arguing with my wife about this because okay. she wants to go out of the country to sit on a beach and do romantic vacation stuff. But I really want to go on that South America trip where they go find Emerald tree boas. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I believe I, you're talking about this guy. Yeah, that's the one. And that's I, the I one wanna, right there. Uh huh. Yeah, I want to go. I want to go to South America, and I and I want to catch Emerald tree boas. So I, I'd like to do that maybe next year if I can. This year we're going to go on a cruise, so this year's vacation kind of is what it is um but next year i either want to do that or um i want to do something either in australia or papua um you know wherever i can get with people that i trust i don't trust myself to go to those places by myself but you know yeah. i know Mutt, i know mutton wants to go on an adventure so um i'll tag along with you know people smarter and more experienced than me oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, this has been awesome. Uh, where can anyone find you who's interested in, you know, learning more about you, seeing what you have available, you know, shout out everything that needs to be shouted out. So Morelia House on Instagram is where I'm the most active. <clears throat> um, I haven't posted a YouTube video in years, and that's probably not going to change. Um, but uh, Facebook, Brandon Wheeler, uh, Instagram, Morelia House. And uh, I love talking about all of this stuff. So if you just feel like talking snakes or you have any questions or, you know, whatever it is, hit me up. Hell yeah. Well, dude, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to throw you backstage and close us out. Stick around if you'd like to. Um, but again, dude, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great episode. I, I really appreciate you stopping by. It's been fun, man. Take it easy. Hell yeah. All right. Good night, Brandon. All right. Well, that concludes episode four. Uh, thank you to everybody who's been listening either live or if you are catching the replay on any of the podcast platforms. Uh, thanks to everybody who was in the live chat tonight. A lot of awesome questions, a lot of awesome discussion. Uh, you know, that that makes these episodes all that much better to have all the interaction. Um, for anyone who wants to see what I have going on social media, it's Scrub Shepherd on Instagram, just Stephen Cush on Facebook. Uh, for anyone who's interested in scrub pythons, check out the new Somalia group on Facebook. Uh, kind of our little grass grassroots group we have going on over there, but all about sharing information and uh, eliminating the gatekeeping. But uh, but yeah, that was this week. Uh, we have another banger set up for uh, for us next week. So thank you everybody. Tune in again next Wednesday, and uh, we will we will see you all soon. Good night, everybody. <laughs>